everybody to this afternoon's everyone planning we'll start off by the membership of others at least two changes uh, am i right saying councillor patrick's here for john taylor correct and councillor thompson is here for kath taylor right Item two, minutes of the previous meeting. Can we pass those as a true record? Move them, Chair. Thank you. Declarations and interests. Um, start off with Councillor Acta. Nothing. Councillor Patrick. Um, yes, Chair. Um, Unfortunately, I um, volunteered to sub before I saw the agenda. I've got uh, an, an other interest in the first item, so I'll be sitting that one out. Uh, and then aside from that, um, I've been lobbied on items nine and ten, uh, no action taken. Councillor Scott. Yeah, I've been lobbied on item 10, 11, 12 and 13. Councillor Granger Mead. <clears throat> uh, I've communicated with officers on item 8 and I've been lobbied on 9, 10, 11 and 13. Councillor Dad. Yep, I've been lobbied on items 10, 9 and 13. No advice given. Thank you, Councillor Lukic. Thank you, Chair. I've been lobbied on items 9, 10 and 11, no advice given. I have um, another interest in agenda item 9. I have members of extended family living in close proximity to the site, but I'm not aware of any representation from them. So just bringing that up for transparency. Councillor Purvez. Yeah, I've been lobbied for 9, 10, 11 and 12 and 13. No advice given. One for uh, item 12, I was asked by one of, uh, by my colleague, Councillor Hussein, to visit the site. That was two years ago. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> right. Uh, Councillor Pinnett. Uh, um, thank you, Chair. Um, right, I've, I've been lobbied on item nine. Councillor Lawson and I were there yesterday morning and were approached by one of the neighbours. Uh, we, we definitely didn't offer any opinion on the um, um, site, but listened to what he had to say. Um, uh, item um, 10, I've been lobbied by... 18 different people um so uh, that's that's quite um extensive um item 11 um we've we've had we've all had representations on that one uh, nothing else chair thanks andrew uh councillor turner Thank you, Chair. Lobbied on items 9, 10, 11, nil advice given. Com Councillor Lawson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, as detailed by Councillor Pinnock, uh, we were on site yesterday at a couple of locations, but um, was approached by a neighbour at the on item 9. Uh, also uh, uh, lobbied, uh, as everyone else, on items 10 and 11. Thank you, Chair. Right, and I've got a full house. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopee. Uh, I will be. Right, I think. No. Chair? Item Chair, you, you didn't ask me and I've got a couple of uh, items on this one. Oh, sorry, I thought I'd ask you. No, it's OK, Steve. No, you're right. You're right, Mark, yeah. Um, declaration of interest item eight. I'm on the board of trustees for Cal, um, and then I was lobbied on nine, ten, eleven. Um, no advice given, Chair. Thank you, Emma. 
Right, item four, admission of the public. There's no private items, Jim. No private item, deputations, petitions. No. No. Item six, public questions. No questions. Right. Item seven, uh, review of planning appeal decisions. Right, Ellie, welcome to everyone and planning. It's Thank always- you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. My name is Ellie Worth. I have undertaken an analysis of the success of appeal decisions within the heavy woolen area. As you can see on the pie chart, um, between January and December 2020, 31 appeal decisions have been received. Of this, 77% were dismissed. This is similar to the data last recorded in 2018, whereby 80% of appeals within this district, well, within this area of the district were dismissed. Three out of the 31 appeals were regarding TreeWorks applications. Two applications for cost were made, whereby one was partially awarded. Three out of the 31 appeals were determined by officers, whereby 23 were dismissed. One application was determined by members of this committee, which was also subsequently dismissed. I have also compared the statistics against central government data, which shows the council to be above average on non-major applications. With regards to compliance, planning enforcement have served 142 notices throughout the district. Of these, nine appeals were made in the heavy woolen area all of which were upheld and dismissed in the favour of the council. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Ellie. Any Anybody got any questions? No? Right, we'll, we'll move on. Right. Item nine. This is the funding application at Barnsley, Denver Dale. Eight, Steve. Mm-hmm. Item eight. Item eight. I'm going back to the other page. Um, this is item eight. This is the leisure centre on Bradford Road at Liverpool. This is this for um, a diversion order of a path, and I believe it's Giles. I think Councillor Lawson wants to speak. John. Sorry, Chair. It was on the previous item. Um, I didn't get to my speak sort of text quickly enough to indicate. We saw that um, temporary stop notices were issued. Do we know whether that's an increase or not? Um, Just locally, it feels as though uh, some enforcement, some enforcement issues have been increasing and there's certainly been a couple of stop notices locally. Uh, I just wondered whether we knew whether that represented an increase or not. Thank you. Sorry, I've just got rid of my phone. It keeps making a noise and it's annoying me. Would you like me to repeat, Chair? It, it's a bit out. I don't know whether this, it's a bad connection, John. We're having a bit of trouble trying to hear you. I just switched my camera off. Is that any better? Because sometimes the camera interferes with the sound. Is that is that any better, Chair? It's all right. A little yeah, bit. That, okay. Yeah, a little bit, John. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try and take it slow then. Um, In the last item, does the number of temporary stop um, notices, does that represent an increase? We've had, it seems like there's been a few extra ones issued locally recently, certainly during COVID. And I just wondered whether that represented an increase. Thank you. Ellie or Julia, can you? Uh, yes, yeah, so thank, thank you, Chair. It's uh, Julia Stedman, uh, Group Leader in uh, Development Management. Um, whilst I've not got the exact figure in front of me, um, I can confirm that there has been an increase in the uh, number of uh, uh, like enforcement notices served throughout the uh, like over the last uh, 12 months compared to previous years. Um, I did a um, sort of a similar item presented at Strategic Committee. Um, couple of uh, sessions ago uh, where we had sort of the exact numbers in there um, but unfortunately I don't have them directly to hand but yes there, there has been an increase. Thank you Chair. Okay thank you Chair. I think 
just some uh, thanks to officers and their vigilance for, for keeping on top of this. And uh, probably just something we should just keep an eye on over the next 12 months just to make sure that uh, we've got a grip we've on, a grip on, on issues. Thank you. Uh, thanks, we can hear you now. You're the loose wire. It's mm -hmm. sort of down now, John. Right, item eight. This is Ben Valley Leisure Centre, Bradford Road at Liversidge. I think it should be Giles. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Giles Cheatham. I work for the Council on Public Rights of Way Matters. Uh, this agenda item is not a planning application, but concerns an application for an order to divert a public footpath. As part of the development of Spen Valley Leisure Centre, the Council's project team has applied for an order to divert part of public footpath 110. So the existing alignment of public footpath 110 is the solid black line A to B. Um, the new pool building is not affected, but the redesigned car park areas are. Um, after a preliminary informal consultation, an order was made under officer delegated powers in 2019, uh, but this attracted one objection which was not withdrawn. Um, after discussions with the applicant and the objector, the council's project team for the leisure centre decided to amend the diversion application proposal. The new proposal is the dash line B to C shown on uh, plan one uh, in front of you now. Uh, and it amends the proposed new path by uh, moving it away from the Palisade fencing for part of its length uh, southwest of C, um, uh, providing greater path width where it is not moved from next to the fencing around the athletics sports ground. Um, providing a graded slope down to the bridge over the River Spen, so that's the area down at B, uh, and the graded slope will be a maximum one in 12 and will replace the steps that are there. And also the uh, proposed surface type is also amended. Uh, we have undertaken a second preliminary consultation, again sending out emails and letters and posting notice on site. Um, uh, basically, I'm looking to report to members because we've already made a diversion order that we would not be looking to take forward. Obviously, the detailed report is before you. Um, bringing this decision to committee would provide a committee record of decision, would acknowledge that a different proposal is to be taken forward, despite the previous making of a legal order. Um, we have no further update comments to report to members and no objections have been received to this amended proposal. The officer recommendation is to make a new diversion order in accordance with the amended proposals and to seek its confirmation. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Giles. Um, Sandra, have you anything to add to it? No, not on this one, thank you. Right, thanks. Right, members, it's uh, just being asked to consider it. There's no for or against. Any questions from anybody? No? Right, then you and thanks, Giles. Yeah, so that's being approved, the diversion. Do you want to do a show of hands or are you just... Yeah. Right, yeah, done. Right. On to applications, page 45. Chair, Chair can I just yeah. come in on the transparency about observers, if that's OK now, if I can come in now? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Sandra Haig, legal officer, just wanted to say before we go on for anybody watching the meeting, in the interest of transparency and protection of the integrity of the planning process, members who are not on the committee but have indicated that they wish to observe the meeting are being invited to join on, on teams. At today's heavy wooden subcommittee meeting, Councillor Watson is observing and has indicated that he wishes to speak on item 11. Councillor Watson will be invited by the chair to speak for five minutes as per the normal protocol and he won't be participating any other way in the meeting unless invited to do so by the chair. Thank you. Right, thanks. Uh, right, agenda item number nine, page 45. Bounce the road, Denbydale. Victor. 
it looks like it's you. It is. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Victor Grayson, Development Management Master Planner in the Majors and Minerals team. This is an application for full planning permission for a residential development of 34 units. The site is located on the southern edge of Denbydale on the north side of Barnsley Road, the A635. The wider plan shown in this slide has annotations that pick out some of the locations referred to in the committee report, namely the A635, A636 junction to the west of the application site, the application site allocated site next door and York House site that all are roughly in the middle of this stretch of Barnsley Road and the junction to the east where the Dunkirk Public House is located. The application site shown here is a previously undeveloped greenfield site bounded by a wooded beck to the west where there are TPO protected trees, a small open space and the residential properties of Kenyon Bank and Inkerman Way to the north, and beyond the public footpath, the allocated site HS136 and Inkerman Court to the east. To the south, on the opposite side of Barnsley Road, is Inkerman House and Pool and the grounds of those buildings. Um, given that highways issues are an important consideration at this site, members, I'll, I'll just show some images of Barnsley Road to illustrate a few things. Firstly, in the smallest image, uh, we see the bend in the road uh, in in the distance where the where the um, where the road disappears as it turns towards the right, and also in that image, members can see the entrance to Inkerman Pool there on the right, where the white uh, vinyl banner is is hung on the on the stone wall. The second image, the largest image on the right hand side of this slide, shows the westbound approach to the application site, and members here can see the overhanging vegetation on the south side of the carriageway. And then thirdly, the bottom left image uh, is an image provided by a local resident which illustrates some of the parking that occurs on Barnsley Road. I understand residents have also emailed members directly with images of, of Barnsley Road and its traffic. Barnsley Road is the subject of a 50 mile an hour speed limit. It has a footway along its north curb and it has no yellow line markings restricting parking outside the application site. These six images illustrate a journey through the application site, starting with the top left image, which shows the footway on the north side of Barnsley Road. Then we see the existing gated site entrance and then a view looking northwards across the site. The site, as members can see, slopes downhill towards the north, towards Denbydale. Uh, on the bottom row from left to right, we see the gate that exists between the application site and the adjacent open space to the north. Then a view looking north across the open space towards properties on Kenyon Bank, which are at a lower level than the open space. And finally, the path that connects the open space to Kenyon Bank. And here we see images of the site, the application site from the public right away that runs along the east edge of the application site. The two smaller images show views from the top and bottom of the stretch of public footpath that runs along the edge of the site. The larger image is taken partway along the footway, sorry, the footpath, and that sh this shows uh, the relationship between the site and the existing properties to the north on Inkerman Way. I've touched on some of the designations and constraints already that are applicable to the site and its surroundings, but this plan illustrates some of them. Of note, the wooded beck and open space to the west and north of the application site are urban green space as designated in the local plan. The footpath that I mentioned previously is shown in purple and on the other side of the footpath is the adjacent allocated site shown in orange. To the south, uh, land is within the green belt. In terms of what's proposed, 34 dwellings are proposed as a, in a mix of as a mix of terraced, semi-detached and detached units with one, two, three, four and five bedrooms. Seven units would be affordable, provided as one bedroom starter homes in the terrace adjacent to Barnsley Road. A new vehicular, en vehicular entrance is proposed on Barnsley Road. To the west of this, the existing dry stone wall 
along the north footway of Barnsley Road would be rebuilt along a new alignment. And this, together with the narrowing of the carriageway to the west of the application site, is intended to achieve adequate visibility at this new entrance. Directly outside the new site entrance, the applicant proposes a right turn pocket within the existing carriageway for use by vehicles approaching from the east. This would be 2.5 metres wide, leaving three metre wide running lanes either side of it. Within the site, the application site, the two, sorry, two arms of a new estate road would run downhill. An area of open space is proposed at the site's northwest corner adjacent to the existing open space. And a landscape corridor is propo proposed along the beck to the west. A 300 cubic metre attenuation tank, which includes allowance for storm events and climate change, is proposed beneath this open space from where surface water would drain via a hydro break to the adjacent beck. Dwellings would be two storeys in height, although three storey rear elevations are proposed for four dwellings. Those are the units two to 25. Hopefully members, you can see my uh, pointer just pointing out those four units. And the two other units proposed close to the site's northern boundary would have north-facing elevations taller than two storeys due to, the, due to the site's topography. In this slide, the top elevation shows units 26 to 34. Those are the dwellings proposed along the eastern edge of the site. Members, please note the site's slope downhill towards the north and the difference in levels relative to the existing dwelling to the north, which is there shown there on the left. In the middle, I've included some images of some of the house types. Natural stone walls and slate roofs are proposed throughout the development. The lowest elevation shows units one to nine, uh, and that's what the development would look like from Barnsley Road. The site is allocated for development and residential use here is considered acceptable in principle. Applying the council's master planning policy, although it is not considered necessary to require the submission of a master plan or a single application for this and the adjacent allocated site, some cumulative impacts that would only arise if the adjacent site is developed are addressed in the recommended section 106 heads of terms. An acceptable residential density is proposed, as is a good mix of house types and unit sizes. All but one unit would comply with the government's nationally described space standard. The one non-compliant unit is a three bedroom semi-detached C3 type dwelling, which only falls short by 0 0.7 square metres. And apologies members, the, the grey highlighting um, that was supposed to be included in table in the table of paragraph 10.50 of the committee report hasn't come through in the published version of the report, but that only highlighted the one uh, non-compliant unit. The proposed affordable housing provision meets the council's 20% requirement. Although a greater mix of affordable unit sizes and tenures would normally be sought, for a scheme of this size and given local needs, the provision of one bedroom starter homes is considered acceptable. The proposed designs reflect Pennine vernacular, natural stone and slate are appropriate materials for this site. The applicant's drainage proposals are acceptable and the lead local flood, flood authority no longer object to the application. Potential impacts upon adjacent dwellings and TPO protected trees are considered acceptable. Subject to conditions and a planning obligation uh, relating to biodiversity net gain, the proposals are considered acceptable in terms of their ecological impacts. Uh, now, 185 representations re were received in response to the Council's consultation and reconsultation, including representations from the Upper Durham Valley Environmental Trust, Denbydale Parish Council and Councillor Simpson. Also, a further representation from a resident of Inkerman Court was received yesterday afternoon. The comments are summarised in the committee report and uh, committee update, and much of the local concern relates to highways impacts. Now, regarding those matters, and specifically highway safety, a key consideration is the adequacy of visibility at the new site entrance proposed at Barnsley Road. Members will be aware that the appropriate length of visibility displays at site entrances is determined partly by the speeds of traffic, and that while, for example, a 50 mile an hour road would normally require 160 metre long displays, government guidance allows for shorter displays where actual typical driven speeds are lower. So speed surveys have been carried out by the applicant and by officers to ascertain those speeds. And based on these findings, the applicant has demonstrated that the proposed 103.6 metre display to the west of the new site entrance would be adequate. To the east, the bend in the road provides adequate visibility. The proposed right turn pocket is also considered acceptable. 
Although less wide than the usually expected three metres, the vast majority of vehicles using it would be narrower than the pocket and other sub three metre pockets in the borough are known to function adequately. It is considered that the, pro the proposed access arrangements would not introduce new or increased highway safety risk in relation to movements in and out of Inkerman Pool opposite the site. Other concerns regarding visibility for westbound traffic relate to highway maintenance and are not considered to be reasons for refusal of planning permission. No injury accidents have been recorded along this stretch of Barnsley Road over the last 10 years. Notwithstanding officers' assessment regarding highway safety, the applicant has offered to provide a financial bond to allow for the investigation, public consultation and potential implementation of a reduction in the speed limit outside the site from 50 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour. It is recommended that this be accepted for other reasons relevant to planning. I should mention though members that as noted in the committee report, this acceptance would not guarantee that the speed limit would be reduced. Um, as the traffic regulation order would, of course, be subject to a separate process and consultation. But Section 106 agreements funding of that process attracts sufficient positive weight in the balance of planning considerations to justify it being secured. The proposed development will generate approximately 26 two-way vehicle movements in the morning peak and 28 in the evening peak hour. This is not considered significant in the, context, in the context of the local highway network's capacity. Adequate on-site parking is proposed and subject to adjustments, which it's recommended can be made at condition stage, the proposed internal road layout is considered acceptable. Approval of full planning permission is recommended as per the revised recommendation in yesterday's committee update, subject to conditions and a section 106 agreement that includes obligations relevant to master planning and which ensure that the cumulative impacts of this and potential adjacent development are properly mitigated. Thank you, Chair. Right, thanks, Victor. Right, we've got a few speakers. Um, first speaker is Graham Brown. Right, Graham, we have three minutes, and your three minutes starts of now. Okay, hello, thank you, Chair. Uh, right, so the access, it's a 50 mile per hour road. In my opinion, it needs to be guaranteed as a 40 mile per hour road, not just 40 mile an hour based on consultation and investigation. In my opinion, here's why. The justification to depart from DMRB standards is based on 86 speeds. However, I believe that the applicant, consultant, and the council are not using the data from the speed surveys correctly. They appear to me to be omitting data from the most recent surveys to give lower speeds and therefore greater justification. Section 10.7 of the committee report shows that the justification is based on the original transport assessment, not the recent surveys. Now, the data that I believe which isn't being used is in fact from surveys requested by the council, which were, and I quote, to offer a degree of comfort. These surveys being the week long tube survey and the HVS survey. As part of the justification, James Turner, in his response, and also in section 8.3 of the committee report, it states that. Quote, on each occasion, the 85th percentile speed were significantly below 50 miles per hour. Now, perhaps this is true if you only use the original survey speeds, which were 39, 41, 42 miles per hour. I'd say not true if you use the latest survey speeds at 44.3 miles per hour and 46 miles per hour. So in section 10.67 to 10.69. Now, it's 46 miles per hour, significantly lower than 50 miles per hour. Victor Grayson, in an email from the last week, says that the applicant's explanation for the proposed display event is convincing. In the same email, then he then quotes the applicant's consultant as saying, all the surveys that have been quoted, so submitted, have designed speeds less than 70 kilometers per hour. So 120 meter displays must be appropriate without taking into account 
or broker agents. Now again, this is true if you only select the original survey data, with Twitter speeds converted, you get 62, 65, and 68 kilometers per hour. However, if we look at the speeds from the recent data surveys, we get speeds of 71.2 kilometers per hour and 74 kilometers per hour. Therefore, not below 70 as stated. So, forgive me, but in my mind, what I see is 30 what I see seconds is left. We can depart from standard if we can justify it with 85% speeds. And we can show justified speeds if we pick the surveys with the lowest speeds. Now, one last uh, little bit just out of interest. In the same village, on the same road, in fact, with the entrance only 160 metres away, the York House application you lined up, please. the response from the council saying the display lines are substandard. That's your three minutes. Not quite, is it? Yeah. Well, for the response I got was the sightline should be 100. Yeah, three minutes. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I've got Joel You've got three minutes starting from now. Thank you, Chair. Um, three points for me. First one, highway safety, two points on this one. Number one, revised plans improve the visibility displays to the right, but any benefit will be lost if on the street parking happens, which it already does. Number two, visibility for westbound traffic isn't good enough. The report from Northern Transport Planning explains the criteria used in DMRB is from a document called Geometric Design of Major Minor Priority Junctions. Based on that, and the speeds observed, the distance of 120 metres would be needed. And the council's report says officers are of the view that 103.6 metres is considered acceptable. So obviously what matters is actual visibility, calculated by Northern Transport Planning to be just 85.5 metres. That's far lower than either figure, meaning it would be unsafe. Next point, the surface water drainage. The plan is to drain the slash well back to the west, and while the hazard of the new development would be above that level, some houses in Kenyan Bank are below it and were flooded in 2007. The applicant's flood and risk assessment lists a need for a stormwater drink, uh, storage facility with a capacity that works out at 431.6 cubic metres. In the revised plan, that tank is only 298.35 cubic metres, so that's obviously too small. And I'd like the lead local flood authority to investigate that, go back and have another look, essentially. Final point for me is regarding the amenity area, including overlooking and loss of privacy, crime prevention and landscaping. Now my house backs onto this amenity area at the northern end of the site. And it's a hillside, so anyone standing there can see straight my upstairs and downstairs windows. My garden's at the side of the house, so there's hardly any separation between my family indoors and two others looking in. And there's three houses in Kenyan Bank affected. The middle house had some separation from the back garden, but would still be badly overlooked. And the house adjacent to the footpath would be affected more so and by noise as well. The applicant's design of access statement says well thought out landscaping will enhance the character of this amenity. But there's been no opportunity for the council or residents to assess this because no detailed plans have been presented for it. The council's report says the open space proposed at the application site's northwest corner and its pedestrian connection to Kenyon Bank will help create an appropriately connected, walkable, permeable neighbourhood in compliance with local plan policies. But it doesn't comply with several planning policy documents, all of them from the seconds. Well, hear me out. Please say shared rear access footpaths must not be placed at the back of properties. They also say public open spaces should not be positioned bordering the rear of gardens, but as them should separate rear gardens from any open space. Safe for places. You wrap up, please. I thought no, I've got my three minutes, I'll finish then. Safer Places says it is desirable to restrict... That's three minutes. Um, what would you like to say? No, you've just had three minutes. Uh, okay. Right. Well, I think I make the point. Goodbye. Next is Jul Julian Slater. So Jim Kerr.
Hi, Jim. You've got three minutes starting now. Yeah, yeah, please start. Okay, good afternoon, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Following the paper I issued yesterday, let me down. Know. He's got the thing on in the background. He's he, needs to, he needs to switch off his thing. Yeah. Can you mute? We're getting a load of feedback. I can, I can hear myself about. Ten seconds after I've said something. I've got it on. I've got it on. It's on. on it's on mute at the moment. Right, that's okay. Right, your three minutes starting from now. Okay. Thank yeah. you once again. Uh, I'd like to clarify a few points following my paper yesterday. There was a misunderstanding between myself and Mr. Grayson about what information can be shared and how. So my apologies for any inconvenience caused. Uh, uh, a couple of other clarifications uh, in terms of uh, 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 notes on the, the, the paper itself. Uh, and I've confirmed to Mr. Grayson this morning uh, that I've amended a couple of the other comments. Uh, to ensure that the report is accurate as possible, which I think is important, I've reflected these changes in a new document which I reissued for circulation this morning. In all honesty, I don't really have much to add to my statement, which I hope is fairly clear. I've worked in operations for over 30 years, trying to make things work more efficiently. I come from the school of common sense, but the problem with common sense is that it's not common enough. And this would appear to be the case when it comes to this proposed access solution to the new development. Quite simply, the road is not fit for purpose, for the purpose it is required to fulfil. And this generates an unacceptable level of risk to residents and commuters using this busy and fast road. The curvature of the road creates risk, the width of the road creates risk, the speed of the road creates risk, and yes, you've got it. It is just too risky on all accounts for you to approve. Chair, I think the pictures in my reports speak loudly and clearly about the inherent dangers in approving this application and are probably more relevant than the pictures that were shown uh, by Mr. Grayson. Uh, they clearly show that you have to straddle white lines at every opportunity to travel on that road due to HGVs. I'm sure some members of the committee will have visited for it themselves, and I will be amazed if they felt that it was fit for purpose. In addition to the serious access issue, the constant building of new housing in the area is destroying the fabric of the community. Lovely views and green fields are disappearing, and residents across Derby Dale are quite rightly up in arms, frustrated and angry. In closing, enough boxes from a legal or statutory perspective may have been tipped, but has the bar on safety been set high enough? I think not, and I have yet to find anybody, even independent non-residents, who think that using the E635 Barnsley Road for access is viable at any time, regardless of speed limit. This decision will affect Denby Dale for years to come, and I ask you to think long and hard about your decision today, or if voting is required at a later date. Thank you, Chair, for your time and for listening, panel. Right. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Next, it is Julian Slater. Right, Julian, you've got three minutes and it starts from now. Hi, uh, it's Julian Slater and I own Nicholson House in Lincoln and Paul. Um, we've lived here 21 years. Paul has um, significantly more vehicle movement than we proposed for the existing site. We have something like 300 days of publishing each week. We have 300 children aged before between um, four and ten for me every week, and we have something like 500 families on our book, and we have provided employees for about 30 people. And we're not NIMBYs, which is welcome, but you know, 
and run a business in the local area, immediately opposite to the slope by the side. And the majority of our customers are young parents with their very valuable packages, i.e. their babies and toddlers, the young children. We are really, really concerned about the actual impact that this development will have in the, the, the safety of the, the pool due to the lack of ability. three minutes from now. Okay, thanks very much. Right. I, I am with my wife in the house and Inkerman Pool. We've been here 20 years. Our customer base is a large number of people who swim baby and to toddlers. We do water confidence courses for 300 babies and toddlers a week and we also do swimming lessons for 300 children aged 4 to 10 every week. We also have about 500 families who swim here on a regular basis. Our vehicle movements are up to about 70 movements per hour, which is inconsiderably in excess of those projected for the new development. Yet, the reports that have been made for the committee clearly don't identify the risks that are associated with, with that. The majority of our customers are young parents with their very valuable passengers, their babies, toddlers and young children. Many of the customers are relatively inexperienced drivers and they can be stressed and easily distracted. These are factors that need to be taken into account in assessing the safety of those customers and as they drive along the A635 and they enter and leave our premises. You only have to spend a short time at all watching our customers and to realise that they're not the world's most experienced drivers and their safety needs to be paramount. While we're here, we're really, really concerned about a number of factors. One, there's parking along um, Barnsley Road as already identified. Where will that parking go when they put the displays in, when they narrow the road? Equally well, there is inadequate parking on the, the or provision for parking. I understand it meets the regulations, but the reality is you only have to look at Bromley Bank and you'll see large number of cars parked all along the road and on the adjacent side street. We will see more cars parked on Barnsley Road which will further impede the visibility. These factors need to be taken into account in assessing the safety of the proposed development and its impact on customers of Inkerman and Pool. And the, the head of the family says that the, the other factor is that when you come in and out of Inkerman and Pool, we've got some fairly high walls, and when you look to the left and right, you need to be sure that the visibility is good. As I've tried to show in the photos I took and sent to the members of the committee yesterday, you can see that the visibility is severely restricted. Nobody has actually looked at and taken account of that restriction of visibility and the impact of the And so that's, on that basis, I, I believe that the committee should take account of the safety of the road users of this area and in particular the safety of the users of income and pool and should reject the proposal. And I would right. also add... That's three minutes. Thank you, Julian. Okay, thanks. Thank you. 
Finally, uh, Stuart Brown. Three minutes starting from now. Okay. Thank you, Chair, members of the uh, Planning Committee, for allowing me to speak. My name is Stuart Brown of Yorkshire Country Properties. And I'm speaking in favour of the officer's recommendation to approve our planning application. Yorkshire Country Properties are a local house builder, only building within the Kirklees area. We've been operating within Huddersfield for many years and only employ local trades people, subcontractors, and suppliers. All our materials are sourced locally, including the natural Yorkshire stone and stone root slates. Our business philosophy is based upon working partnerships and a collaborative, flexible approach where possible. I genuinely feel that this approach has resulted in a superb project which satisfies stakeholders and delivers much needed quality housing in Huddersfield. At the very outset of this project, I felt that speed reduction along the section of Barnsley Road would be a sensible way forward, not only for the site, but also the wider area and neighbouring properties. As per the officer's report, it's not strictly necessary to reduce the speed along the section of road. However, I still feel this is the right thing to do. As such, I've committed to delivering this speed reduction, which is outlined in the officer's report. Ecology, one of our company key value pillars is minimising our ecological impact. Uh, initially, when we, uh, we, when we designed the site, uh, uh, we included the beck as a feature within the rear gardens of houses 9 to 12. However, upon further ecological assessment, it came evident that an ecological corridor would be a better solution where ecological enhancement in this area could be created as part of the overall scheme. Some residents have raised concerns about hedgehogs. Last year, we partnered Hedgehog Streets, which is a joint campaign by the People's Trust for Endangered Species and the British Hedgehog, Hedgehog Society. All our housing projects are hedgehog friendly, and we automatically design hedgehog travel routes through garden fences to enable foraging hedgehogs to feed and find shelter. I hope everybody can see that we are an inclusive, considerate and local developer. We've worked extremely hard to present the project in front of everybody today, which we feel addresses stakeholders' concerns. If anyone has any questions for me, then I'll do my very best to answer them. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stuart, for that. Um, right. We've heard quite a lot there about highways issues. So have we got Jamie here? We have, Chair. Thanks. Uh, through you, Chair. It's Jamie Turner, House Development Management. Uh, just quickly pick up on something that, that uh, Stuart Brown said then about the, and one of the objects about the 40 mile an hour speed limit being proposed. Certainly no objection from uh, from our perspective. Um, or th the issue is why we can't say, yes, make it happen, is because it has it does have its own consultation process. So it, it's, it, it's it has to go through that legal process to be allowed, so we'd have to consult local residents to make sure they're happy, they were happy with it. Local members again would be consulted. Um, it's the same with any traffic regulation order. It's just that we can't preempt what what the people who are most affected by it would, would wish to see. Um, then, in terms, I know there's been a lot of uh, talk about the visibility. I'd just like to start with a quote from the highway consultant from uh, Via Solutions. Uh, in in response to the, some of the concerns, they stated that uh, 40 miles an hour is equal to 64.4 kilometres per hour. The factual speeds are not known. It's normally rounded up in the design manual for roads and bridges to 20, or safety DMRB from now on to 70 kilometres per hour. Where speeds have been measured, as is the case, as is this case, then all these are normally used for design purposes. All surveys that have been quoted submitted have designed speeds of less than 70 kilometres per hour, so 120 metre splits would be appropriate without taking into account the road gradients. Where there is an uphill gradient on the approach to a junction, then braking distances are, redu are reduced. Braking distances are reduced, and in turn, so can the visibility splits. The formula used by DMRB and manual for streets take into account the approach gradient has been used to derive the splay requirement. That's the end of that quote. So this 
I'll, I'll say this methodology is accepted by many councils and as such there are precedents made nationwide we have to take into account. Initially, the council asked for visibility displays commensurate with the speed limit or justification if these cannot be achieved. In this instance, to DMRB standards, given they were, given they were below the standard looking west, the Highway Consultant commissioned an independent speed survey. The council carried out its own speed survey and the consultant again commissioned a week-long speed survey to ascertain the 85th percentile speeds on this road. They're all in the report. The visibility display looking to the west from this proposed access corresponds to those expected for the 85th percentile vehicle speeds recorded whilst taking into account the gradient of Barnsley Road. To clarify, the manual for streets requirements normally used on lower classified roads are less onerous and calculations on a flat road would equate to a display of 77 miles, uh, 77 metres. Uh, there was an issue with the uh, westbound drivers coming from east to west and the visibility there. The visibility is good to the curb line, but um, the, the concern was that the people turning right in wouldn't be seen. Would, uh, the right turn pocket means that drivers won't be in a live lane. And whilst normally we would ask for, a vis for the pocket to be three metres wide, as Victor mentioned, uh, there are two examples where by the Dunkirk pub where the pockets are 1.8 metres wide and they, they work reasonably well and again in our highway design guide we'd ask that a, via, a, a road, a two-way road, a state road will be 5.5 metres wide so obviously with, with a three metre live lane and the two and a half metre wide pocket um, if it was a quieter road we'd say that was okay for, for the road width because it allows two vehicles to to pass two large vehicles. Um, I can leave it there for now. I suppose I've just got a comment on the, the amounts of parking within the site, but it's just, it is up to standard. So it didn't put, wasn't put forward as a reason for refusal. Uh, thank you for now, Chair, but obviously I can come back in. Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, councillors, it's over to you. Councillor Thank you, Chair. Um, I visited all the sites this morning, including this one, and observed the traffic speeds, which obviously I didn't have any measuring device, but they appeared to be significantly lower than the post of 50 miles an hour. And I think that the 40 mile per hour consultation process has a reasonable prospect of success. Um, there's a couple of issues um, I'd like Five, officers four. to comment on. Um, Firstly, the layout, we've got all the, it looks like all the affordable housing is clustered. Um, and I thought that our local policies were to distribute those fairly evenly. Um, so I was wondering if that's been, if that part of the layout has been discussed with the developer at all. Um, secondly, there's some visitor parking bays apparently sticking out into the middle of the road near the site entrance. And I'm just looking for some highways comments on on that, whether that, you know, makes whether that would cause any problems for large vehicles, refuse collection vehicles, emergency vehicles, etc. Thank you. Graham, Councillor Turner. Thanks, Steve, Chair. Um, thanks. Um, there's a lot about this that is really good. Uh, the developers work really well with the, the offices and uh, we're all aware that whilst we welcome a, a reduction, probably all welcome a reduction in the speed limit, that is not something that we can determine at this time. That is its own separate legal process, which has been pointed out by offices. But I would be disappointed if the, if this development was, was to go ahead that that wouldn't be um, uh, go through its own process and be approved. Um, as I said, there's a lot to be said for, about this being a good development. The developers work, work well with offices. Uh, it's good quality stone. It's a slate roof. The good quality. I've seen developments from this developer before. They're um, substantially well built, much better than some of the people we uh, we get to talking to us. Uh, they've got a good proven track record. Good mixture of smaller start homes, which we, we're well aware we need. Um, 
uh, and um, the travel plan, which was included later. I would like to just make a point on that, that that should be included, but not necessarily work with Metro, but look for some alternatives that may be available to us in, in, the, in the near or not too dis distant future within the local area. Um, I do have concerns about the sight lines, uh, and I shall think about that before we get to these. Oop. Have you finished shuffling your papers? Um, <laughs> I, am, I do have concerns about the sight lines. It's, it, it, they are close to those two bends, but as I say, it does have, it does have a lot of merits, but I'm, I am concerned about the sight lines. Right, thanks, Graham. Uh, Councillor Granger Mead. Thank you. Oh, uh, some of the points I was going to raise have been brought up, so I won't repeat those. Um, last time this came to the planning committee, there were a lot of concerns from residents um, about the loss of the green space, which would mean a loss of drainage um, and therefore cause a lot of surface water running into the river below, um, causing problems in is it Inkerman Way and Kenyon Beck, I believe. Um, but according to uh, point 0.5.1, point um, there has still not been a flood risk assessment drainage strategy done, um, which I would have thought would be quite fundamental. But I know you did mention earlier that uh, the flood authority said it was acceptable. But bearing in mind uh, the concerns of residents, I just thought, you know, a full assessment could have been done, um, which it hasn't by the sound of it. Um, it does state in the in the plan that um, an alternation tank is going to be put in in the northwest corner of the site um, to collect the surface water and this will flow into Ashwell Beck. Um, does this water from Ashwell Beck then flow into the river below? That's what um, I just wanted clarification on that because if that's the case, then as far as I'm concerned, I'm not an expert, but the the problem probably still stands. Um, so I just want that sort of um, looked at and to make sure 100% that it's not going to cause problems further down, really. Uh, Councillor Scott. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Granger Mead just brought up about the drainage. So that was one of my issues that I, I was looking at and also about the sight lines. And uh, I, I think we should be for if, if we were to minded to approve this application, I would actually bring the, the actual speed limit down even further because that looks it is a, a very, very busy road and it is dangerous and it having sight lines and traffic aggressing from there is worrying too so um, a lot of it's been covered so I'll just keep it brief and I'll come back in a bit later. Thanks Cassidy. Uh, um, thank you Chair. Um, it, 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 it does seem to me that, that, that um, um, actually having looked at the site uh, you can appreciate quite a lot of things that, that you wouldn't you wouldn't see from the pictures um, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment I, I have some concerns about the highways issues that have already been mentioned but there are there are uh, there's well there's one other thing that 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 is not really very clear to me um, you can't necessarily tell from the the, the overhead um, um, photographs or the ground level ones that the the um, slope down to the uh, stream is actually quite a considerable slope. It's very steep, um, and um, the houses that are on the the western edge of the site. Um, look to me and it's not it's not really very clear where they are in relation to the slope and there's no cross section given to show that um uh, th these are quite big houses um and I, I just wonder what their relationship is with the slope um because because as i say it's it's um uh, it's a it's a very steep slope down down to the uh, the stream um I, the the evidence that we've had given to us by the people from Income and Court, um, I think, is very um, very important. Um, and the the photos that 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 Julian Slater 
uh, produced in the email that we had yesterday uh, are quite significant, showing, um, uh, well, giving an indication of what the right turn in the lane would do to traffic coming down down the hill, which at the moment, of course, is subject to a 50 mile an hour speed limit. And although we have evidence to show that it's very 50 miles an hour is rarely attained, um, uh, there will still be people coming round that bend, which is which is not blind exactly, but it's, its visibility is not good um, in relation to people coming out of, of Inkerman Court, as well on, on on top of people coming in and out of this site further up the hill. I I I think I would tend to agree with Councillor Scott actually that that. Uh, 30 mile an hour limit would probably be appropriate uh, up to above um, the um, um, the site of the, the, the right turning lane um, because simply because th there, there could always be some people going at a speed that is inappropriate with all these conflicting movements uh, going on added to which there is there is the question of people turning right coming out of the new site um, which is which is yet another conflicting movement uh, on a road which uh, people have already described as being uh, busy and in in parts a bit dangerous. So um, I I would certainly go with trying to reduce the um, speed limit as far as possible, simply because we are getting a lot of conflicting movements here in a very short stretch of road. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Andrew. I'll get some answers from officers first and then we'll go on to Councillor Lawson and then uh, Councillor Turner. So, Victor or Ryan, do you want to come in and clear one or two of it? So. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll you. come in as well, Victor. You, you go first, Victor, and I'll come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks to you, Chair. Um, just picking up, uh, I think it was Councillor Lukic uh, queried the distribution of affordable housing on the site. So um, yes, the preference would have been for uh, a wider spread or wider distribution of affordable housing units across the site. Um, although it is, it's not the, the largest of major applications that we're dealing with here. So um, uh, there is perhaps less of a need for uh, distribution of affordable housing um, uh, in more than one location across the application site. But Really, the main reason for the uh, the seven affordable housing units being uh, grouped together in that in that one terrace at the south edge of the site is to do with the applicant's proposal to provide them as as one bedroom starter home units, um, which the applicant has made some convincing points in support of. He has he has pointed out that there is a need for this kind of housing, and it helps, as I mentioned in the committee report, it does help. Um, ensure that local people, perhaps young families or people moving out of their family homes, can stay local when they want to get on the on the on the property ladder. And obviously, the most suitable kind of accommodation for for that for that group of people is one bedroom units because they're often single people um, who want to live on their own uh, at least initially. Um, and then the fact that they are one bedroom units. It, it, it's it, they're they're better provided, or they tend to be better provided as as terraced houses, and this is a suitable location, the, the southern edge of the site, for a terrace of houses like that. So the, the the distribution and the type of affordable housing is connected to the proposed tenure that the applications um brought forward at application stage. Um, but um, yeah, members can attach some negative weight to that to that matter if, if they feel that a better distribution across the site would have been preferable but those are the reasons why the applicant has proposed um, at least that aspect of the scheme. Um, in terms of drainage and flood risk just to respond to Councillor Grange and Mead's points um, the reference at paragraph 5.1 of the committee report is um, is to do with the, uh, the pre-application advice that was given um, a couple of years ago and at that point um, councillors um, will be aware that um, 
applicants don't often prepare a full f- flood risk assessment. But at application stage, a flood risk assessment has been submitted and has actually been revised during the life of the application. So, so the the local flood authority is satisfied with the work that's been done on that front. Um, and the question as to where Ashwell Beck flows to, uh, yes, it does continue northwards through culverts beneath Kenyon Bank and eventually joins uh, the River Dern at a point to the north, um, just uh, underneath um, underneath Springfield Mills, I believe it is. Um, and Councillor Pinnock's queries regarding um, levels of the of the units, that's units 9 to 12 adjacent to um, Ashwell Beck to the west of the site. We don't have sections, but um, but the applicant has submitted an engineering drawing and I can just run through. Um, Chair, if you don't mind me just sharing uh, the layouts. To explain these points, please just bear with me. So hopefully, member, hopefully members can see the, the proposed layout again here. And if I just talk members through the relative levels. So unit nine, which is this, hopefully you can see my cursor, my pointer, is the uh, detached unit closest to the uh, to closest to Barnsley Road. That would have a finished floor level of 179.95 metres above ordnance datum. And then the nearest level of of the beck um or oh, sorry the lowest level of the beck across from that unit will be at 177.9 meters so there's a two meter difference between uh, the beck level and the finished floor level of that unit nine but then levels do become a lot a lot more uh, significantly more different um, as we go north so unit 12 according to the applicant's drawings would have a finished floor level of 175.3 metres above finished floor, above ordnance datum level. Whereas the the brook, sorry, the um, the beck at that point would, according to the applicant's drawings, would be at 169 metres above ordnance, survey, ordnance datum level. So the, there would be a difference of uh, around six metres between finished floor level and the watercourse um, behind them. Um, Unit 12. Hopefully, Councillor Pinnock, hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. Right, thanks, Victor. Uh, Ryan, do you, want, do you want to come back in on? Uh, I was it seems yeah, as though yeah. members yeah. want to discuss the 30 mile an hour zone, even though we can't do that here. Uh, yeah, I'll come straight back on that, count, uh, members, if we could. Uh, the speed limit order. Um, when it, was, when, it was, when it was, uh, it may, may have been pre-app or it might have been at the very beginning of this application, I can't remember off the top of my head, but we, the the applicant was more than willing to lower it to 30 miles an hour. Uh, it'd actually be cheaper on their part because we wouldn't need repeater signs. I consulted our highway safety team um, and they weren't happy for that to go ahead. Not for, not because it wouldn't make the road slower and safer, but the, it's, we don't like to see un- unrealistic speed limits on roads. And because this is a, it is a near road, it is a through route. It isn't built up on either side, as, as it would be. It's not a village centre as such. Then people tend to ignore, ignore that and and maintain that higher speed where you do come into a built up built up area. So that that was um, that put the kibosh on on, on us doing that. When the, as as consultations continued, we said, well, you know, how how about this this 40, 40 miles an hour as not a compromise, but given the speeds that had been measured by ourselves and twice by the, the applicant again, um, it seemed, like Councillor Lukic said, that it would be an achievable thing and, and probably quite a reasonable um, speed limit that, that wouldn't be out, out of the way. Um, there's currently a speed limit review being undertaken by the highway safety team. And um, whilst I suppose that may bring its own results, this, this was just seen as an opportunity to have the, uh, the speed limit reduced should it get through the uh, its own consultation process at, at their cost rather than the council's. Um, oh, Councillor Lukic mentioned about the visitor parking bay has been unusual, it's jutting out as into the site. Yes, they do. Uh, we asked for uh, vehicle tracking on that. And that's, to be honest, we're gonna have, we'll, we'll be securing the uh, 
that section of layout by condition because whilst they have provided uh, the sweat path analysis for a, one of our refuse vehicles, it, the, the, it's a bit it's it's awkward. There's still things that are just slightly up in there with it. Nothing to say. Well, it's, you know, it's absolutely miles out of the way. They can be resolved, but just, we just haven't seen that plan yet. So it's likely that those uh, two visitors bays that jut out would be either relocated or removed, or but would 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 certainly wish to see the visitor, that level of visitor parking maintained. However, however they, they end up doing it, and I know that it's been uh, mentioned the visibility again. Um, obviously, because it was because the visibility available was far less than that. You'd expect on a 50 mile an hour road. We have, you know, it's been 12 months of, of ongoing talks, consultations to get where we are, and the applicant has, has eaten, eaten up every little bit of their land available and entered into the highway to narrow it down to a point where it, it can't get any narrower for safety reasons. That it, it is an A road after all. It's still at its narrowest point, 7.3 meters wide. Um, that that is the the extent of the visibility available to us. We've got to this point through a lot of talking, a lot of negotiation, and a lot of work between both ourselves, myself, Victor, and, and the the, uh, the applicant to get to the point where that's the best we're, we're able to achieve or we're going, that we're going to achieve. Um, I don't know if there are any, any other points. Um, I can, I can, I can, if, you, if, you, if you remind me of them, I can, uh, I can come back on them. Right. Uh, thank you. Come. Sorry. Councillor Lawson. Thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of what I'm about to say has probably already been said, so I'll avoid those bits. Um, <laughs> thoroughly agree with all the all the conversation about speed. I would, I would just add that uh, any change in speed limits obviously is hard to get used to from local residents, so we just need to make local residents aware with like as robust a program of signage and what have you as we can possibly manage. Um, income and pool does look to have um, an issue with a concertina effect of presences outside its, uh, you know, outside its accesses. So I think it really does need nailing down on that. I understand the reasons why we can't nail it down here, but it does really need pursuing. And I think if you, you know, I'm just saying if it was in my ward, I think we'd be pursuing it as local councillors as well to try and uh, just try and nail down that that was pursued and and uh, and, uh, and, pers and uh, arrived that safely. I would ask um, in 8.4, there's um, a question from the flood uh, the flood people about the withdrawal of Unit 13. Now, has that happened? And every all the all the units have been renumbered, so there's now a new number 13. Or is is Unit 13 still extant? I just a quick question there because it does seem integral to some of the flooding and draining issues. Um, I would also mention it's a possibly a, a nitpick, but um, it's the terraced block. Um, usually under design principles, we we stay away from terracing like the plague, um, and I understand that this is kind of supposed to be echoing something that's already happening uh, just up just not very many yards away but I'm not I'm not convinced that the terracing is is, is 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 where we should be going and as a design uh, principle um, I would say though that actually looking at the plan that's in front of us um, and this is one of the benefits of full planning permissions of course is that you can see a little bit more strength than just an indicative plan is that there does seem to be something said for this in terms of density. Um, so often now we see we see uh, applications come forward that are just trying to max out every last square inch, and this doesn't seem to be one of them. And for that, I think there is there is credit to you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, John. Uh, Councillor Turner. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, just going back to the speed limit, if you if you note in the report at the at the pre-app, we had a long conversation with the developer about the speed limit, and it was one of the things I was keen to see was a, was a reduction in that limit. The problem being is you, how would you go from 50 to 30? We have to be realistic. People are driving along at 50 to drop to a 30 will be. I'd, I can't. I'm, I've been trying to think. I don't know anywhere necessarily see an awful lot of that. Uh, so I think 40 is a compromise. I think because uh, I think just asking to go from a 50 to a 30 will be 
will probably be a stretch for for a lot of people because it, it is near road. It is it is at further up towards the east. It is quite wide and open, so it is somewhere where you can where people do max out the speed limit. So I think that's probably probably a bit of a stretch from a from an application point of view of that. So I'm I'm, I'm perfectly happy with with going down to a forty. As I say, it was one of the first things we discussed with the developer. He did offer to to do that if uh, if the application is successful. I'm just picking up on one of the things that I think it was Councillor Pinnett mentioned about the the way the land slopes down to the back of Kenyan Bank and Income and Way there. Uh, this was one of the sites that obviously was proposed in the local plan. And, and it's one of the sites I uh, objected to. Now I get that battle's now now gone. We've lost that battle. But that, that was one of the, my concerns: how it slopes down and backs onto those other houses, so they can be a bit imposing uh, as as they look out upwards. You know, looking upwards towards the houses. Um, so really, that's just a, my little bit to add. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Kathy, Kathy Scott. Yeah, uh, I'm going to come back in on the highways issue. I hear what our other members are saying about going uh, from a 50 down to a 30. It's extremely difficult. I'm quite a cautious driver. It's called braking and we're looking at the signage of what the law says. Um, I understand that it's nothing that we can decide here about the, the actual highway speed limit, but would it be in order or something different that we look at and say, Yes, should we minded to approve this application that they consult immediately with residents, have the traffic order put in place because we're going to have heavy goods vehicles, everything, delivering plant works to be for that site to be developed. And I would like to see the traffic reduction immediately as they as before they progress this site. Right. I don't know which officer wants to come in on that and offer some legal guidance. Uh, through you, Chair Victor Grayson speaking, um, I think I might have to pass over to legal or highways people about when um, when consultation on the TRO could commence. But I, I would make one point that the um, the applicant is keen to help out on this front. So I very, I very much dare say the applicant will be willing to um, put the money forward to fund that consultation fairly early on after permission is granted if permission is granted by committee today um chair just whilst i'm speaking can i just come back on one point that councillor um lawson raised his query was to do with unit 13 and whether or not it had been uh, amended as per uh, the request of the lead local flood authority the answer is yes it has so the the site layout plan that I showed members earlier on um, is up to date. That does show unit 13, which was previously an N type unit, now replaced with an S type unit, which has a narrower footprint, which frees up more space on the north side of that unit for um, flood routing and for maintenance of a, of a land drain that would run along that, that edge of the site. Um, so through you, Chair, if I'll hand over to perhaps Jamie on the TRO issue. Yeah. Hi again. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the, just just to I'm just trying to find the email I got about uh, the speed, the reducing down to 30. Um, but I can't. But just go back to the um, yeah. To go back to the length of time. I mean, a, a speed limit order from the moment you start instigating, saying yeah, we're going to look into it, it can take six to 12 months, depending on on um, sort of the, the local opinion again. It depends if if, it, if people object to it, if it comes if it has to come back to a committee itself. Um, and wouldn't I've asked the question about highway safety team whether it's feasible, and they, they told me that they were doing this speed limit review, but this could be dealt with separately. What they, have, what they ha haven't said or given me any indication of is, is the time scales in terms of their staff time, um, where it would come in their, their agenda. I mean, we, we can obviously push for it to be done, and we would receive the money up front for it to be done, um, but to say. Say you know, it gets say it gets approved today, or it gets further approved at the next meeting, where, wherever it may be. I can't, I, I can't, I wouldn't be comfortable saying yes, we can start tomorrow, or yes, we can start in a month's time because I, I just don't know the answer to it as it, at, at the moment. But it, it, it's obviously something that everybody seems keen to address as quick as quickly as possible. That's that's all I can say really. Right, thanks, Ryan. Andrew. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I um, 
I do remember these developers. We we were looking at a site in Skelmanthorpe, I seem to remember, and and they were spoken of very highly on that occasion. So it is it is it is refreshing to have to have to work with somebody who who <laughs> who does actually listen to what uh, what is what is said and is and is keen to act on it. But but having said that, I, I want to come back to the points made by uh, Mr. Slater about about the traffic in relation to Income and Court. Oh, uh, all right, uh, if this wasn't here, that would be that would be his problem to sort out. But we're going to put a um, a, a pocket in the middle of the road, uh, which will have an effect on the traffic coming down the hill uh, from the east. Um, and um, whether whether it slows up or not, I don't know. But but I I am I am concerned about that in relation to people coming out of or going into uh, income and court. Um, and as I say, it's not directly connected um, with with this application, but it's 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 going to be affect, affected by the work needed to make this this development so um i'm i'm not totally happy that the road safety aspect of the speed limit etc has been uh I, i'm not totally happy with all of that to be honest and and um i i'll i'll um, i noticed nobody has moved moved a decision one way or the other yet um so we're still obviously all all thinking about it um it, it it's it's got one or two things that that um that are slightly awkward problems so I'll, again i will leave it at that councillor turner wishes to come in um, thank you and thank you to the vice chair um <clears throat> Uh, referring to what Kath said about the um, routing speed limit, may almost making it a condition of the application, I think that would be, uh, as a person who, who tries to be fair and judge and, and take a balanced view on this, I think that would be unfair on the developer because we don't know how long that would take. We all know these things take between six and 12 months, as the highway is often rightly pointed out, and to put his considerable investment on hold for six to nine months. And then what happens if for whatever reason it doesn't go through? Does he have to start all over again? So I don't think we should make that any, you know, sort of a condition, Cathy. I think uh, we should make it a, um, if this goes through, it should be implemented as soon as possible, um, but it shouldn't be a condition of, of the development starting should it seek or gain approval today. Cathy? Yeah, uh, Chair, uh, I want wasn't conditioning it. I was asking for this to be uh, done, you know, for them to do it. I understand what you're saying and about the time limit. Uh, I'm not sure this is dealt with on local issues as well, so it could be expedited quite quickly. Um, I'm happy to move this application because, as Andrew uh, Pinnock has actually said, Councillor Pinnock has actually said, this developer has seen the work before and we know that they're keen to support communities and the residents around there. So I'll move this application, but obviously hoping that they look at this highways issue and make it a priority. So, a bit of progress moved by Councillor Scott. Councillor Andrew? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I will um, I, I will second that, but I, I would also like to include a clause that I've that I've suggested before, and that is that um, the construction management plan includes provisions for talking to um, local residents. And in this case, I think it should include a condition. Well, not condition. Should should they should, we should make sure they talk to the people involved with income and court, so that so that um, they can resolve any issues relating to. Uh, conflicting movements um, in relation to the two sides. So I'll, I'll with, with that, with that, if, if Councillor Scott is okay with that, um, um, uh, I'll, I'll second it. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Councillor Lokic. 
Thank you, um, Chair. Um, just to clarify, I think Andrew's been saying income and cart, but I think he's been meaning to say income and pool in relation to the comments well, Julian Slater's been sorry. making. Yeah. But it's just, so it's just making sure that, you know, we talk to the right people yeah. in terms of progressing everything. Apologies. That mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> no, no problem at all. I'm, I'm, that's all I wanted to say. Victor. Thank you, Chair. Just to jump in on, on two points. Um, I wanted to mention that the, the cost of the consultation on the TRO is not actually a lot of money. It's it's um I'm guessing it'd be less than ten thousand pounds. And uh I would suggest that the section one oh six agreement could be worded to require early payment of that money or at least a part of the money that, that covers the, the consultation the local consultation on the TRO. Um, and then perhaps if the TRO, if the consultation um, determines that the TRO is appropriate, then then the the rest of the funding can be can be triggered um, and paid. Then um, I don't think that would be massively problematic for the applicant, given the the likely low amount of money relative to the the cost of developing this site that would be involved. And then just secondly on the um, the suggestion by Councillor Pinnock to to require the applicant to talk to the operat operators of income and pool and other surrounding residents. Um, members who attended or are um, or have a seat on strategic planning committee will recall that a similar thing was um, um, recently secured in connection with the Owl Lane development up at Chidwell. Um, there's no reason why um, we can't require the same of this applicant at this site. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Victor. Right. We'll make some progress. It's being moved and it's being seconded. So we will go to a vote. Thanks, Chair. So voting on the delegate to approve on the recommendation moved by Councillor Scott, seconded by Councillor Pinnock, and the revised recommendation in the update. Councillor Hall? Thor. Councillor Actor. You're on mute. You're on mute, please, Councillor Actor. Four. Oh, thank you. Councillor Dodd? Four. Councillor Granger Mead? Four. Councillor Lawson? Four. Councillor Lukic? Four. Councillor Vase? Four. Councillor Pinnock? Four. Councillor Scott? Four. Councillor Thompson? Four. Councillor Turner? Abstain. That's carried then, thank you. Right, thanks for that. I think that one does highlight how important it is for some, for some applications to come to a committee. Good outcome that, well done. Right, page 81 next. And this is, oh, we're stuck in its own neck of the woods. Green Acres Close at Emily. Victor again. Thank you, Chair. Okay, this is a this is um yes, as you said, Chair, land at Green is close. Emily, this is an application for outline planning permission for uh, residential development uh, with all matters reserved other than access. Members will recall that a decision on this application was deferred at the Heavy Woolen Subcommittee's meeting of 4th of November last year. In this presentation, I'll focus on the reason for that deferral and how the matter has been addressed by the applicant. However, I will need to go over some of the information previously presented in November. Um, the application site is located between the residential streets of Wentworth Drive to the west and Greenacres Close to the east. A cricket ground and uh, football ground are located to the north. These are designated as urban green space in the local plan. The Emily Millennium, Millennium Green is located to the south and is mostly within the green belt. Two public rights away across the application site as shown in purple on the larger image on this slide. The site is allocated for housing in the local plan with an indicative capacity of 44 dwellings. The site is a grassed greenfield site and currently has no buildings. There are no TPO protected trees within or adjacent to the site. However, the, however there are trees and shrubs around its edges. 
and just to show members some views of the site and its surroundings. Um, the first image uh, top left shows a view of the point where the public right of way that crosses the site diagonally leaves the site on the site's northern boundary. Then we see a view from within the site of the gates at the terminus of Green Acres Close, which provide access to the Millennium, Millennium Green. And then bottom left shows a view across the site looking north. And then finally, the the image uh, on the bottom at the bottom right shows a view from within the site of the point where vehicular access will be provided from Wentworth Drive. This is the applicant's access points plan showing the new vehicular access proposed off Wentworth Drive and the retained existing access points. Just to clarify members, if outline planning permission is agreed today, um, only this drawing and the site location plan would be included in the list of approved drawings on the council's decision letter. And I say that because this plan that's been submitted by the applicant is only indicative, obviously at outline stage, um, uh, no, no layout for this application needed to be submitted. But this plan does illustrate how a residential development could be accommodated on the site. Um, and this this plan, of course, would not be would not be approved if the council decides to grant outline planning permission. This plan illustrates the improvements proposed by the applicant to the public right of way to the north of the application site. And then here we see two images of, of Wentworth Drive, which members will know is the uh, the, the road to the uh, west of the application site. First of all, is an old, rather old internet image of the terminus of Wentworth Drive at the west end of the application site. And hopefully you can see my pointer, but I am now pointing into the the strip of land at the terminus of Wentworth Drive that has previously been described as a as a ransom strip. And then the other internet image shows the Wentworth Drive Beaumont Street junction, and this is the junction for which members asked for more information regarding existing parking levels to inform further further discussion regarding the impact of the proposed development upon safety at this junction. Members will be aware that with vehicular access only proposed via Wentworth Drive, all of the proposed developments vehicular traffic would use this junction. And then finally, in terms of slides, um, this slide illustrates the extent of the applicant's parking survey, which was carried out in December last year following the committee's deferral of its decision. So members will recall that the majority of representations made in response to the council's consultation have raised concerns regarding highway safety and congestion, with many residents raising concerns regarding additional traffic at the Wentworth Drive Beaumont Street Junction. So the applicant carried out parking surveys following November's deferral. These were carried out on Thursday the 17th of December between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m and 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. and also on Saturday the 19th of December between 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. The findings of these surveys revealed low levels of parking around this junction. No more than four vehicles were recorded within that red dotted line. Now the nearby public house, the White Horse, which members can see annotated on this slide, was closed at the time the surveys were carried out. However, given that a reopening date for pubs and other hospitality is not yet known, it is considered unreasonable to delay, to delay the determination of this application until after the nearby pub has resumed normal business. In light of the parking survey findings, Highway Development Management officers reconfirmed their advice that the junction would continue to function safely with the development implemented without the need for a junction improvements or a traffic regulation order. Officers also note that adequate sight lines are available at this junction. Notwithstanding that advice, the applicant has offered to fund a TRO related to parking restrictions at this junction. It is recommended that this be accepted. As noted in the committee report, and we, we are talking perhaps in some ways as to a similar situation with the previous application, this acceptance would not guarantee that parking restrictions would be introduced as the TRO would, of course, be subject to a separate process and consultation, but the Section 106 funding of that process attracts su sufficient positive weight in the balance of planning considerations to justify it being secured. And just to cover 
again cover the other main planning issues relevant to this application. Regarding additional vehicle movements, the applicant's predictions when adjusted in accordance with officer advice do not demonstrate significant amounts of additional traffic in the morning and evening peaks that would severely affect the local road network or adversely affect highway safely, safety. Significant local objections were received in relation to impacts upon the adjacent Emily Millennium Green and access to it. To reiterate, re reiterate, however, the layout shown earlier is indicative and would not be approved at this stage, at this outline stage, if members to uh, if members re resolve to grant outline permission. That is, although these matters would need to be addressed by the applicant before a layout is proposed at reserve matter stage, outline permission would not interfere with access rights to the green. There are also local concerns regarding the ransom strip, as it was previously described, at the terminus of Wentworth Drive. This is adopted highway through which vehicular access could be taken. And to reiterate, under this application, vehicular access would only be permitted from Wentworth Drive and the applicant would not be able to revert to providing access from Warburton to the east at some point in the future without having, without having to submit a further planning application. The lead local flood authority do not object to the applicant's drainage proposals or flood risk assessment and apologies members that section of the committee report was not updated following last November's deferral that was my mistake apologies for that the lead local flood authority's comments are however online and as I said they, they don't object to the application an earlier objection from Sport England has been resolved other planning matters are considered in detail in the in detail in the committee report 235 representations were received in response to the council's consultations. These, sorry, council's consultation. These are summarised in the committee report. Councillor Simpson, Councillor Turner, Mark Eastwood MP and Denbydale Parish Council have raised objections. It is, however, considered that the proposed development is acceptable in planning terms at this outline stage and that other matters would be addressed at reserve matters stage or via conditions or the recommended, recommended section 106 agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Um, right, we've got a few more speakers. First speaker is Mark Eastwood. Hi, Mark. You've got three minutes and it starts from now. Good afternoon, Chair Member. Thank you. Uh, by the Planning Officer's admission, this application is essential a resubmission of a previous application, but with a revised access proposal. The pre previous application was correctly rejected, and many of the objections raised for that application remain relevant to the one before the committee today. The officer's report and the applicant assert that the access issues have been resolved following further research. Other than simply claiming that the ransom strip is now an adopted highway, it would appear the applicant has provided no following evidence to back this up. Land registry documents have been submitted to the council demonstrating the ownership of the strip, and it's my understanding that the applicant does not feature on any of those documents. There appears to be no update to the public records on the land's ownership, nor, I would suggest, has the applicant submitted any proof of agreement with the land's owners to demonstrate a resolution to site access concerns. The important of access is covered in both the National Planning Policy Framework and Local Plans Local Policies. It is a material matter when considering an outline commission, and so it will be inappropriate on the grounds of access alone for this application to proceed, proceed without proof that the access issues have been addressed and resolved. I would urge the applicants to keep this evidence and make it publicly available. A number of other highway issues also remain, including widespread concern regarding traffic, with the main road through Emily already being used as a rat road, and the difficulties that existing pedestrians currently have when accessing footpaths safely on upper lane. I am not aware of any plans for road improvement and the application does not detail enhancements that can overcome safety concerns. The proximity of the property means that widening the road cannot be an option. Without steps being taken to ensure the safety of the roads around the proposed access point and evidence of viable access altogether, 
the proposals are unsustainable and the application should not be given outline for approval today. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Cheers. Next, we've got Guy Loveridge. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Guy. You have three minutes and it starts from now. Thank you. Um, my name is Guy Loveridge. I live in Emily. Um, uh, Mark Eastwood, our MP, has covered a lot of the points I was going to raise, but it bears reiteration. The so called ransom strip, where is any evidence? Um, this has to be a material consideration, surely. I would um, raise an issue with uh, Mr. Grayson's assertion that there will be no additional traffic impact by figures based on DVLA and RAC Foundation research. Currently in the UK we have 1.2 cars per household, so that would be 58.8 cars if 44 dwellings were erected and allowed to be erected. They will all be going in and out a road uh, down Wentworth, which when I measured it two days ago, at places, because people are currently on furlough, cars are 7.2 feet apart. You're not going to get any developers' vehicles down there, and also it could not stand the weight of traffic from 58.8 cars. Uh, too much is reserved here to be followable by a layman or credible. Surely more detail is essential, even though it is an outline application. When we drive Clermont Street Upper Lane, the access there is bad now. Um, to carry out the survey in December during the global pandemic lockdown, is, um, well, it's not indicative of what Emily is like on a normal day. Um, the recommended stopping distance from 30 miles an hour is 75 feet. There isn't 75 foot of clear sight at that junction in either direction at the moment. So increasing the through flow of traffic will be asking for trouble. There have been two child knockdowns in the last five years along that stretch of road, and that's speaking as a 10 year time served chair of uh, governor at Emily's first school for five years as a chair. The footpath, DEN stroke 2120, um, why is it now okay uh, when it was rejected before, when there were no changes at all or apparent in the application? That will lead to the flow of anyone walking to the centre of Emily straight to the Millennium, the uh, Stump Cross Junction, which is a diabolically poor access and you have to be actually stood in the road to see in either direction there to get across. And the bus stop was indeed moved from there because of poor sight lines. The Millennium Green rights and accesses appear to my reading to be ignored. And um, as I said, how will the site be accessed by development traffic if uh, Mr. Grayson is correct and nothing will be coming up Warburton when the issue of the ransom strip hasn't really been resolved? Um, the local school is at, Ten at the moment near enough. Um, we've been told there are no funds or room for more pupils there. If you bring in this number of people, they will be pretty upset. You're up, they please. Be there. Uh, so thank you for listening. Those are my points uh, for consideration, please. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Next, we've got Barry Brook. Afternoon, Barry. You have three minutes starting from now. Thank you. I'm, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Barry Brooks, speaking in my capacity as chairman of the Emily Millennium Green Trust the Charity. We're pretty frightened, by the way. It's the 21st year of this um, self funding community project. It's valued for its views, flora, fauna, and it's part of England, single singularly beacon change, something like that. It's requested for national events. It's a government initiative for volunteers who raise the money to purchase the land. They also purchase the rights of access over the land, which is the nature of this application. So the land on this application has our rights on it. These rights were incorporated into government-wise into the land registry, which also includes the trustees' obligations to maintain and landscape this green for access by all forever. From, from 2018 to 2020, many high on applications were made. None of these re re referenced our access rights, 
They should make sure small parts, they might show sure others. We were fenced off completely. I mean, I didn't even bring that All parts of a vehicle turning circle, and it was in here without land up as well. In January, oh sorry, access rights also for maintenance of fences was now secured by buildings in this application. In January 21, planning was amended to show access to the Millennium Green via Green Acres Clause, which might include construction, so we need to know that because we've got all kinds of legal tenants going out, so we need to ensure everything around that. It seems that high stones ignore or reinterpret our rights, and our objections were not acknowledged. However, we did stop their unannounced digging of our landscaped area. Pools can't go on. Green, good, sorry, the pools we raised, and we've got some plans for the future with lots of things coming in. Can't, they can't go on, on, on legal challenges, but they've got the green habitat. Um, and we'll be struggling now to get our rights back. The proposed housing with its carriages is too small for today's cars. And the footpaths not over the tram. It will be not seconds. social tensions. These will affect the green even before the housing extensions are added. In future, if we if this goes ahead, we'll be unable to un stop or announce the unit of our green. I still power will make our land registry obligations and they are obligated with our slaves. Then donations and trustees will volunteer to trustees. Right, that's three minutes. We'll keep going, but we're frightened. Please reject this. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Next. Thank you. It's Paul Ooh. Kemp. Right, Paul, you have three minutes, starting from now. Good afternoon, Chair and Councillors. I hope you managed to read the documents I sent to you from Hall and the case solicitors, including title deeds and plans from the land registry concerning the ransom strip. These clearly show the ownership of the land, where the adopted highway at the end of Wentworth Drive finishes, and the boundary of the development site. The adopted highway does not cross the ransom strip and does not enter the development site. The applicant has said the matter of the ransom strip has been resolved, but we have not been provided with any evidence as to how this has been achieved. As access is the only consideration for this application, then evidence should not should have been provided for public consideration. Access is not a commercial or reserve matter. It is a highly important material matter. Footpath Den 2021 20, is to be the main pedestrian and cycle access to and from the development. The proposed improvements finish halfway along the path, where it then crosses the unlit car park and vehicle access for the Wentworth Park Community Centre and Football Club. The path then exits onto the busiest junctions in Emily at Upper Lane, where there is no footway and where visibility of approaching traffic is limited. To quote Kirkley's Highways, as part of the decision to reject the previous application, there is no, therefore no place of safety for pedestrians to stand when emerging onto Upper Lane. Why the same footpath with no additional highway safety measures accessible 12 months later? The applicant in Kirkley's Highways cannot safely mitigate this issue in planning terms. This application should be refused as it does not meet local or national policy requirements. Also, the applicant has not clarified if green acres walkers is to be used for construction vehicles. Again, this is not a reserve matter, it is a material matter, not only for highways, but will compromise Emily Millennium Green's rights and access. The site cannot be described in any way as sustainable. Residents are reliant on private vehicles Public transport and cycling or walking to work is unfeasible due to the topography of Emily. The applicant has not shown how this matter is to be resolved. Councillors, I respectfully ask you to refuse this application as it would 
not be safe or appropriate to vote to approve. Thank you. Right, thank you, Paula. Thank you. Next is Paul Butler. You've got three minutes, and your three minutes starts from now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members. I'm the agent on the application, and I am speaking in support. Your decision today should be based on the applicant's response to the one matter of deferral of the November committee, which was to allow the applicant to carry out parking surveys at the West Bus Drive at the Fourmont Street Junction. This survey is having undertaken. While full, full details of the survey are outlined in the committee report, the applicant has asked the highways consultant, Martin Whitaker of Optima Highways, to speak today to provide you for the details of the approach taken and the results found. The survey confirmed that there are no specific highway safety issues in association with on-street parking at the junction. As such, no specific mitigation measures are considered to be necessary the direct result of the development. However, the applicant has offered to fund future monitoring of the junction and the implementation of a traffic regulation order to limit parking at the junction should be deemed appropriate following consultation with local residents. All other highway considerations were discussed and resolved at the previous planning committee. As for all other aspects of the development proposals, the site is allocated for housing in the adopted local plan. The planning application has been outlined and the level of information submitted to support the application is proportionate and robust for an outline application. There are no objections from statutory consultees or technical officers of the council. There are no legal issues or land ownership issues associated with the development of the site. Those aspects from Wentworth Street is from the adopted highway. There is no ransom strip. This is being confirmed by the council's highway officer and legal officer. Indeed, it is the council's own evidence and records which confirm this. The applicant has full legal right to develop the site in the manner envisaged, and any legal effects of others will also be taken into account, including those of the Millennium Green. There are no legal, technical, or environmental constraints associated with the development of this site. The development will deliver a number of benefits to the area, including the delivery of 20% affordable homes on site. It will deliver a contribution towards improvements at Emily Fair School. It will deliver contributions towards improvements improvements at the recreation ground located at the site. It will also fund the improvements to the public footpath which connects the site to the village centre and to the Millennium Green. The development proposals will deliver much needed high quality homes to the area and provide wider benefits to the local community. We therefore hope you can support your officer's recommendation today and improve the planning application. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Next, next speaker is Martin Whitaker. Afternoon, Martin. You're three minutes starting from now. Thanks, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Martin Whitaker. I am Director of the Highways and I'm here to speak in support of the airline application. As confirmed within the case officer's report, all highway related matters have been agreed and the Council's highway scheme have concluded that the proposals are acceptable and that the head of Wentworth Drive requires to access the site forms part of the adopted highway. Well, in consideration of the application in November 2020, members resolved to defer the uh, decision to allow the applicant to carry out parking surveys at the Wentworth Drive and Beaumont Street Junction to identify whether the development would result in an adverse impact on highway safety. As such, we have agreed the scope of these car parking surveys with the Council's highways and planning teams, which were undertaken by an independent survey company on Thursday the 17th of December and Saturday the 19th of December 2020. The scope of these surveys were agreed with highways in order to identify the times upon which on-street parking would be at its highest, i.e. first thing in the morning before residents leave to work, late in the evening as residents return, and on a, a weekend evening. Due to the ongoing lockdown restrictions, it was not possible to conduct a survey when the nearby public house was open. However, as a high proportion of residents will be working from home due to lockdown restrictions, the survey is likely to record greater volumes of residents parking on street than would ordinarily occur. 
which is also worth noting that the pub does benefit from its own off-street car park. The survey recorded the locations of all vehicles parked on street in the vicinity of the junction every 15 minutes, over so eight hours on Thursday, six hours on a Saturday. The survey recorded an average of just two parked car two parked cars along Beaumont Street during the weekday, increasing to three at the weekend. The presence of two or three cars parked on the street is not considered to result in any significant or material highway safety issue. This is verified by the accident record, which confirmed that no accidents have occurred at the junction or near the junction over the last 15 years. Based upon the findings of this survey, no specific highway concerns have been identified and no collisions have been recorded to point towards any existing issues with the operation of that junction. As such, no specific mitigation or interventions are considered to be necessary as a direct result of this development, and the Council's highway team have confirmed that the junction would continue to function safely with the development in place without the need for any further improvements or parking restrictions. Notwithstanding this, in order to address uh, concerns raised by members, the applicant has offered a contribution to provide further monitoring and parking once the public house reopens and fund the implementation of a traffic regulation order should it still be deemed necessary following the consultation. As all highways matters have now been addressed, I would respectfully request that you approve this application in line with your office's recommendation. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. I think Victor wants to come in. Victor. Thank you, Chair. Through you, I was just going to offer some more information regarding the what was previously described as a ransom strip and also the issues regarding access to the Millennium 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 Green, if it's an appropriate point to chip in. If, yeah, if you'd like. OK, thanks, Chair, through you. Um, members might recall that when this came to committee in November last year, I did just provide a bit of background explanation as to why or how the applicants have um, have ascertained that they can provide vehicular access from the west end of the site from Wentworth Drive and um, members might recall that um, after the previous application where access was proposed from the east from Green Acres Close and Warburton um, was refused and the appeal um, was dismissed thankfully um, the applicants basically did more research and ascertained that the what's what was previously described as a ransom strip at the end at the terminus of Wentworth Drive was actually adopted highway um, and it's I think I made the point last time that it wasn't just a simple um, uh, matter of of checking an online drawing to ascertain the status of that of that land there was quite a, a, a lot of digging involved in in the council's archives because that that strip of land was actually adopted um, back in 1981 by the council's predecessor body in terms of uh, highways adoption. It was the West Yorkshire Metropolitan County Council that adopted it in 1981 and um, colleagues in highways literally had to dig out um, hard copy drawings of that adoption agreement to ascertain the status of that of that land. And yeah, it was confirmed then in, in a meeting last year with the applicant team that, 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 it, that this land is adopted highway through which the um, applicant can take uh, vehicular access. Um, I can just quote from a, a letter that our senior registry officer sent to the applicants, if, if that's OK, Chair. Um, he did say, I am aware that the land ownership situation in this area, i.e. this strip of land, is somewhat unusual and that this has raised concerns that the parcel of land in question may form a ransom strip. Based on the information currently at the Council's disposal and shared with you above, the council does not consider this to be the case. Um, it is correct for, um, I think it was um, Ms Kemp who pointed out that the strip of land is still in fragmented ownership owned by other parties, not by the applicant. Um, that's correct. And the applicant um, has served notice on those landowners when this application was submitted. Um, and uh, the council hasn't had any responses from those landowners um, in response to that to that serving of notice and um, yes although the the strip of land is in private third party fragmented ownership as I said it is adopted highway and um, officers are satisfied that vehicular access can be provided from from the west from Wentworth Drive. Um, just to reiterate that the applicant is only proposing vehicular access from Wentworth Drive and not from 
um, Greenacre is close and Warburton to the east. Um, so if outline planning permission is granted today, the applicants wouldn't be able to, as I said, wouldn't be able to revert to uh, their earlier proposal for providing access from the east. And then, sorry, briefly, Chair, if I may, um, just touch on the concerns of the Emily Millennium Green trustees. I think a lot of the concerns expressed to do with the, the Millennium Green um, have arisen um, in connection with the indicative site layout plan that was submitted by the applicant team, um, which does show private rear gardens backing up against the north boundary of the green, and um, which would suggest that access to um, that boundary would be limited. And um, the trustees have said that they have rights to uh, to access that boundary and, and um, carry out maintenance along that north boundary. Um, as I said, that layout is indicative. It wouldn't be approved today if, if committee resolves to approve. And those access rights would, of course, need to be addressed by the applicant um, at the future of reserve matter stage if outline permission is granted. Thank you, Chair. Great, thanks, Victor. Uh, Councillor Pinner. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask a question, please, before I go on to anything else? Um, and that is um, um, because one or two of the representations that we've had have said this shouldn't be an outline application, it should be a, a full application and so on. Could I ask the planners, please, under what circumstances do you think people, applicants, normally put in outline applications as opposed to full ones, please? Sh short answers preferred. Victor. Thank you, Chair, through you. Sorry, Councillor Pinnock, I will answer <laughs> briefly. <laughs> um, applicants are free to submit outline applications whenever they want. Um, there's no government restrictions, government imposed restrictions on what kind of applications necessitate outline, or sorry, which necessitate full applications, um, and there's no restrictions on outline. Um, outline applications are often submitted where an applicant doesn't yet own the site or the applicant is the owner of the site and plans to sell it on to a developer and wants to just ascertain that the principle of development is acceptable or in this case um, in addition the access to the site is acceptable in principle. Thank you Chair. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll come back later perhaps. Thank you, that was very helpful. Uh, Councillor Turner. Thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of points. Well, several points, really. Um, we talked about this ransom strip, and we were told some time ago there was a ransom strip, and that's why we had to go through Warburton, and then we were told it wasn't. Now, we've had we've had information from lots of the uh, residents with uh, information from the land registry showing it's in third-party ownership. Now, I'm not one necessarily to criticise officers, but it would have been nice if there is evidence that they do, that it is not a ransom strip and it is part of the highway network, if that information would have been included in the report. Because so far what we've got, we seem to have a bit of he said, she said going on. And just some evidence to support what officers are saying, I think would have been very, very helpful for us all here this afternoon. And it's not in that report. Let's have some documentation uh, if possible. Uh, just just to prove that point that the officers are right I'm not saying they're not but let's have the documentation that proves that because we've had documentation proving the opposite so that's one point uh, again as i mentioned in the previous one this should never have been in the local plan in, in the first place but again that's a battle that's lost i i'm i'm, I'm astounded and it's not often i'm astounded i am astounded Astounded that the people who carried out the um, parking survey only found two cars. It's that is a road I have known for many years. I was, I've lived in the ward all my life, which is considerable amount of years now. And that is a road I use on a regular basis at all times of the day because it's the quickest way into Jewsbury or that part of Kirklees from our house. I very rarely see less than two or three cars. In a, I go in the morning to Terry Wool and Planning Committee for one thing. So that's early morning. I go on an evening. To find that few cars part there, I'm astounded. I really am. And I know the pub's shut. I know we haven't got a date, but apparently we're going to be given one next Monday. 
and at some point the pub will reopen. When the pub reopens, the parking will increase significantly and it not only increases significantly outside the pub and that stretch of road, it up into the estate, it park, people park up there to go to the pub. Yes, there's a pub car park, but it only holds five or six cars and then it's a push because the, the, it slopes, it's poorly lit, uh, it's narrow at one point, it's, it's a very poor car park and, and, then, and there's a suggested number of years that they want to increase it because it is so poor. But the, the traffic parks up into the estate i can know that because that's where i park if i go to the pub there um so i'm as like i say i'm really astounded by the that those findings what i would have liked to see is again i'm not suggesting there's any professional wrongdoing but some some photographs with some time stamps on so we could have seen those um and andrew raised this about being a a, a uh, outline permission rather than full permission and i know we've done this in the past not very often but if this goes through today i would like to see the full the full application coming back before committee i know it's unusual but we have occasionally done that but because of the site and because of the where it is i would like to see this committee make the final decision on the the full application mm -hmm. um and that's it chair patrick uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, similar points, really. Um, the uh, car parking survey, I think, was is shockingly poor. Two days. Um, I, I, I just I, and they identified four cars. Shockingly poor. Uh, I mean, the, 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 I can't I can't take that seriously. Um, it might fit the applicants. Uh, Remit, but I don't think that works for for me as a, a as a committee member. Um, and then to put then to suggest parking restrictions, which presumably they're talking about double yellow lines. Presuming the four cars that they did identify were people who live in the area, where are they supposed to park? Um, you know, no no answer to that really. Don't know where these four cars came from. Um, so I, I'm not convinced by that argument at all. Then we come to the ransom strip, and uh, um, Councillor Turner could well be right that it should never have been allocated land. And we've seen a few of these. Um, maybe that uh, we didn't we didn't as an authority look at look to see if access was was possible. I know some other authorities around the country did do that exercise to see if there were ransom strips to see if pieces of land could actually or should actually be allocated in a local plan maybe we didn't do that as a council uh, and that's why we're we're coming up against these this is not the only one uh, i've seen these in uh, in my ward and and it's a big problem um it's an outline access has got to be part and parcel of this permission if it's granted if you can't gain access you can't approve it um i'm glad councillor turner said what he said before i spoke because it is a delicate matter and uh, and, and as committee members what we have got in front of us at the moment is only only legal evidence that there is a ransom strip we are told there is not a, a ransom strip, but we don't have that evidence. We're simply told. So, um, you know, to my mind, I, it's either what I am told or what I have seen. Uh, and I would suggest that the, uh, the documentary evidence is the stronger evidence that carries most weight. I think if we refused this today on this basis and it went to appeal, I think they would lose on appeal. Uh, and I find myself in a situation where I can't support it because because of the there is no access at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Councillor Scott. I think Councillor Patrick and Councillor Turner have said everything I was going to say, uh, particularly about the parking on the 17th and 19th of December. I I, I do I just well I, I'll say no more on that. What I do want to do uh, is I was going to, um, if members are minded, defer and get the evidence to see about the ownership, because this is really, really important. You know, this is an important part of this, because I'm beginning to doubt that there is access to this site, particularly on what's being passed to us from people that have been lobbying us. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Cathy. Councillor Pinnock. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, it is quite possible for a, a, a public highway, not an adopted highway, a public highway to be in private ownership. That is, that is, you know, that is definitely possible. But we have been told that this land is adopted highway. Um, now, I, I. I think I go along with Councillor Scott on this one because if it was an adopted highway, it would be owned by the council. I think I'm almost I'm almost sure that's true. Um, probably a lawyer will will pop up sometime and say no, that is that isn't necessarily true. But 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 if it's adopted, then obviously the council or a council has adopted it. Um, so. Um, I'm I'm not quite clear where 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 this is going. I think the evidence that we have been given in one of the representations dated from before 1981. I can't remember, but I um, so clearly if if the West Ry West Yorkshire County Council adopted it in 1981, then that will have superseded that document. Um, but I think I think like councillor scott i think we need we need to have that information for certain because because it's no good us um giving outline permission to this site only for it to be inoperable in other words the developer comes back and says i can't do it because because somebody's obstructing me um and and we as an authority can't be seen to do something like that. So at the risk of stretching this out even longer, um, uh, I, I would I would second um, a deferral that Councillor Scott has suggested. Thank you, Chair. So I'll bring uh, Sandra in at this point. Uh, yes, it was just to speak on the Ranson strip. It was raised at the last meeting. Um, and it was investigated. It was investigated, and it is adopted highway. It, that, that there are, it is owned by third parties. That's not that uncommon. It is an adopted highway, and it doesn't preclude you from making a decision on it. It would be a private matter that, but it is an adopted highway. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you, Councillor Granger Mead. Um, like councillors before me, um. I, it's okay officers saying it is an adopted highway, but the only evidence we've got states um, that it's owned and that um, people can only get access um, for services um, on the on the area for development. Um, I have to see things in front of me, and as I can't see anything in front of me saying to the contrary, um, I you know I, I find it very difficult to support this application. Um, the other point is, uh, last time when it came um, to planning, um, I was mentioning about the, the yellow lines um, on the corners and opposite. Um, I have read um, many of the um, residents' letters, and um, I do understand that residents are not in favour of that. Um, so, you know, I fully understand that um, it was sort of meant to be useful. But if it's not useful, then obviously I retract what I said. Um, so just I know this is um, uh, an application that's not in its entirety at the moment. But I did notice actually on the proposed prow at the back um, that there was street lighting proposed. Um, and I just... Uh, was concerned even if this application did go ahead and that um, path still stayed that um, the lighting would affect um, the gardens on uh, Wentworth Avenue um, so just if that can be you know taken into consideration at this point um, rather than going ahead and the last point was um, that the applicant mentioned that um, there was no capacity assessment needed for Wentworth dr Drive as the application is under 50 homes and um, whilst I do understand that bearing in mind the representations we, that were made by residents last time 
regarding the problems with reversing um, refuse vehicles back down the road. Um, I don't know, I just think it's something that really needs to be looked at um, and whether or not a capacity assessment, I know it's under 50 houses, but whether or not if the plans do get accepted, whether or not that actually could go ahead. And I, and I realise it doesn't have to go ahead because it is under 50 homes, but just for peace of mind. And that's that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I firstly wanted to raise on the drive Beaumont Street Junction and um, when I visited the site earlier today there were three cars parked on Beaumont Street directly opposite and uh, when I was exiting Wentworth Drive so I went to have a look at that side um, for the access purposes um, and of course a bus turned up at the same time so emerging from there um, was very tricky indeed and in fact it was uh, the, the road was too narrow to pass the bus um, when turning right out of Wentworth Drive. So uh, I'm pleased to see at least there is a condition there for further monitoring of the parking and fully funding a, a TRO, which is the least we should expect in the circumstances. Uh, there's obviously a cumulative impact on that junction over the years from when it was originally built to serve, I think, just over 30 homes. And then there's been additions made to that over time. So I was wondering if there's any provision in in our local planning policy to look at to look at that the cumulative impact of multiple developments and whether that might trigger a further assessment of the junction um with regard to the access and the, the ransom strip um fully aware it's quite common for adopted highway to be in private ownership and householders for example might often own the freehold out to the middle of the street in front um but obviously it's still adopted highway um We've been told there's a record um, originally produced by West Yorkshire County Council um, saying that this has been adopted, but it hasn't been shown to us. And I think considering how, I guess, uh, controversial that issue is and how much um, and how the committee was originally told um, by the applicant that it wasn't adopted highway and um, that it would have been very helpful to have that record provided. Uh, to the committee so we can verify that i think that's what our residents would expect um and so in, as i think councillor scott moved a deferral to seek that and i'd like to second it <coughs> councillor pervers yeah thank you chair um it was regarding the traffic um obviously in this pandemic they did the survey or well, um i would like them to do another survey when the pubs open when we do get a day and uh, I like to go for a deferral as well like Cathy Scott said. Thank you. Thanks Rose. Right. Any more? Any more comments? No? Well it has been moved for deferral. Yeah, so, so, thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry, it's Julia Stedman. Can I just uh, come in then? So in terms of um, we've had the move and the second or two uh, to defer. So just to clarify on the, the points of the uh, the deferral there, um, our members, so members are seeking some um, sort of some further information um, on the like the, the ownership and then the adopted highway um sort of records held um so particularly in terms of the record held um sort of from the 1981 um record there um so they want to sort of view um view that as part of um sort of a, a future a future meeting um the matter raised just then by councillor pervase in terms of the traffic survey um i think victor touched on it earlier on in terms of um sort of as officers we feel it, it's unreasonable to, to be waiting until the pubs are fully reopened because we don't really know when that could be. Um, I think I'd, I'd hear what members say in terms of some additional traffic surveys from the couple of days which have been submitted um, but I think in terms of if we waited until the pubs pub was fully reopened it's just considering the reasonableness of that. Um, so just something to consider, Chair, in terms of that deferral request. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Councillor Turner. 
Thank you. Uh, can we also make the deferral that the and that condition that when there is a full application, it actually comes in for us to have a, a look at the full application as well. And and just pick up on what Julie said about pubs. And again, I said it earlier. I think I'm a reasonable sort of person. I think making them wait while the the pubs are fully back open might be a stretch because we have no idea when that's likely to be. Even if they're open, we have no idea how long it's going to be before people feel safe to go back out, uh, or, or even if they will go back out. So I think. I think that's probably a little bit unreasonable and I say I am trying to be balanced and fair with with everybody but I'd like to see that that full application come back yeah thanks Graham I wish to God the bloody pubs were open now believe you me right so Kathy yeah. Uh, yeah chair I'd, uh, it's just made me a comment here and I'm, I hope members will agree with me we're living in extraordinary times with a pandemic so vehicle movement and things are going to be completely different so as we're sitting on planning applications if people are submitting traffic surveys it's bound to have a massive impact on the amount of traffic is that something that we could discuss as um, a heavy woolen committee separately because i do think we need to be looking at this slightly different I think that's a good point, Cathy, to be honest. Um, right, move some progress. It has been moved. Before we go to a vote, uh, Sandra, are you happy with points that's been put forward as well for the fail? It's from yeah. the side yeah, of things. Yeah, they've been specified. Yeah, but you, the, the information that you said you want coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. By right, Councillor Scott, second. By Councillor Pinnock for deferral. I'll hand you over to Andrea. Councillor Hall. For deferral. Councillor Axel. For. Councillor Dad. For. Councillor Grangemead. For. Councillor Lawson. Councillor Lucic. For. Councillor Patrick. For. Councillor Pavese. For. Councillor Pinnock. For. Councillor Scott. For. Four. And Councillor Turner. Four. Okay, so that's 11 to be there. Thank you. Right. You're probably aware we've done nearly three hours oh. without a break. You all right if we have a five minute break? Yes, Chair. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, oh, absolutely. Back <laughs> at half past. Back at half past? Yeah. 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 3.30, thank you.
Right. So everybody's back. So we're on page one, two, one, agenda item 11, and this is uh, Barnsley Road, Lower Denby, the Dunkirk employees. Thank you, Chair. Louise Bearcroft, Senior Planning Officer in the Majors and Minerals team. Is that shown on the screen, Chair? Yes, yeah, thank you. So the application site is the Dunkirk Public House, which is located approximately 1.3 kilometres outside of the centre of Denverdale at the junction of Barnsley Road with Dry Hill Lane. The application is brought to committee at request of Councillor Watson. I firstly would like to bring members update um, attention to the update yesterday and the revised recommendation to defer this application. This is on the grounds a highway statement has been submitted in the last few days together with a document entitled report for submission to committee. The timing of this has given insufficient time to properly appraise this information, not least because it requires further statutory consultation. Officers therefore recommend that the application be deferred to make a proper assessment of the highway statement and also to consider any other matters raised in the additional report. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Louise. Members, you've heard what uh, officers just said, deferment for uh, insufficient time to look at highways issues. Now, has any member got any comment about it? Would anybody want to move it or second it or councillor? Turner, come. The council Patrick first. Um, I just wondered whether that had any had, had any uh, information about extra car parking in it. Uh, Councillor, I'll take comments first, and then we can try and knock them out in one. Um, Councillor Turner. Uh, just to point out that the uh, applicant sent an email around this morning, asked it not to be deferred. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Granger Mead. No, I was just going to say the same thing as Councillor Turner. <laughs> um, it's looking as though, are you wanting to listen to it? Are you wanting us to, us to do a determination today? Or are you satisfied with what officers said that they need to look into further information about the highways? Councillor Scott. Yeah, uh, Chair, um, I'd be interested to know about the highways. I've been talking about highways most of this morning, and I, I do believe that if there's been something submitted and we should know, it should be in the report. So uh, I'm supporting the officer's recommendation to defer. Julia, session coming. Julia. Um, it's Jamie from Highways who uh, who can come in just to provide a bit of an overview um, of what's been submitted. But as with uh, as Louise has pointed out, we do need to fully assess that information as officers, and that does involve consulting with our uh, um, our various highways consultees as well. But I'll just bring Jamie in now. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thanks again, Chair Jamie Turner again. Um, yeah, just to address uh, Councillor Patrick's query, um, there's no additional parking for customers. They've, they've suggested there might be some, some overspill for staff, but uh, as I said, they've, they've submitted a highway assessment that I caught sight, first caught sight of on well, yesterday. Um, so I've been trying, trying to look through, but there are just things that just to try and explain. Um, there, there, there have been changes made to the car park in terms of um, they've, it sounds like they've lined it and they've removed obstructions, but again, I, you know, I simply haven't, with, with having to prepare for this today, with the, the other applications, I've not had time to visit and assess, assess that. Um, the safety of the, that staff over, overspill arrangement would need to be assessed. There's an offer to formalise on-street parking, but again, we've had no time to assess that or discuss it with the, the highway consultants and what to decide what would be deemed acceptable or helpful in this instance. Normally, we wouldn't take on-street parking into account. Um, in terms of the parking provision, and they've provided uh, some tricks data for um, supposedly similar sites uh, of similar sized pubs uh, and the levels of parking that would be required for those. 
But I've had a look at those this morning. And um, they're just to, to tell you where they are. They're uh, Cardigan Fields in Kirk, just off Kirkstall Lane, where the Hollywood Bowl and uh, all that sort of development is. That's a harvester. There's a Toby Carver in an industrial estate next to the MS Distribution Centre in Bradford and Row Avenue in Glasgow next to an IKEA and at the edge of the Brayhead shopping complex. So they're not really like, they just don't, we'd, we'd never con consider those as comparable to a site like the Dunkirk. So we would be, had that been submitted a month ago, we'd have been saying, well, I don't think these are really com comparable sites. Can you go back and have a look or we'd do our own? assessment given the the, the nation, nationwide tricks data and try and find some uh, some more suitable say, sites to go back and say well we think maybe you know these should be considered and this is in level of parking that would be required so it's, it's not that we want to be unhelpful or anything just we actually would prefer to be able to help and come to some actual sort of conclusions as to what is and isn't required rather than uh, just sort of being being thrown this at the last minute that's why we asked for it to be deferred thanks chair You're on mute. Do you want to say again? You were on mute. Council oh, Tavares. Yeah, I'd like to move that to a deferral. Council Lukic. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to confirm there's three reasons that were originally recommended for, for refusal. I just want to confirm that. Um, the additional information supplied has a reasonable likelihood of addressing all three of these reasons um before we look at deferring it um I've, i'd also point out i think councillor watson registered to speak if we're still taking him because he might have some useful insight into this application we've got a panel down side that can, can read so uh, um julia are you still wanting this to go down the road of deferral yeah. Through you, Chair, um, just touching on the comments which um, Councillor uh, Lucy had just made. Um, Louise has provided, our officers have provided um, sort of a bit of an overview in the update um, in terms of two of the reasons for refusal. The information we've seen today doesn't address those concerns. Um, I think, Louise, if you want to come in just to expand on, on that, um, like I say, that, that might be worth doing it at this stage. But like I say, with the third reason, the highways reason, as, um, as officers, we need to have the time to assess that information. With it being late submission, um, our recommendation, like I say to members, it is to allow us to defer the application so we can carry out that full assessment. Uh, thanks again, Chair. Thanks, Chair, would you like me to come in? Yeah. Yeah. So the the key document that we've had is the transport assessment, um, which we need proper time to appraise um, and to look at the detail in there. They're now showing staff parking to be in al an alternative location to that what we've currently assessed, which would have been within the car park, along with the customers. The other information, um, I understand it's been it's been circulated anyway. There is some information in relation to the massing. There is a figure provided in the additional document relating to the massing. They've also done a 3D image um, to show. I, I think it's highly likely that that additional information um, isn't likely to change our reasons for refusal with respect to Greenbelt and the impact on the list of building. However, um, we haven't had a chance to make a full assessment of the um, transport statement. Thank you, Chair. Right, Councillor Lokic. That's fine, Chair. Um, no further comments. I'm grateful for the response. Right. So it has, it's been moved. I need a second. Councillor Bay seconded it. I'll second that. Right. I've missed those moved in. Um, Councillor Scott moved to fail, Councillor Bavay second. Right. Fair. So move seconded. I've won you over to Andrea. Um, we'll take a vote. Yeah, so to confirm the vote is on deferral. Councillor Hall. For deferral. Councillor Actor. Deferral. Councillor Dodd. For. Councillor Granger Mead. For. Councillor Lawson. <coughs> Councillor Lawson. Councillor, Councillor Lucic. Oh. 
Councillor Patrick. Four. Councillor Bedez. Four. Councillor Pinnett. Four. Councillor Scott. Four. Councillor Thompson. Four. Councillor Turner. Four deferral. Right, next item is Woodland Grove. This is item 12. Chair, could I just ask a question in reference to um, a speaker not having the opportunity to speak? Is that normal or is it just because it went straight for vote? I, I don't understand. You're on mute, Steve. Right, it's just so that we don't end up having a massive debate as um, some years ago. It's not against anybody. That's just the way that we do it. OK, fine. Right, item 12. Do more Woodland Grove. Thank you, Chair. Can you see the slide? Yes, George. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My name is Josh Kwok. I'm the case officer of this application. This application has been brought to Heavy Woolen Subcommittee upon the request of Councillor Montasso Sain. 16 written representations were received during the statutory publicity. This application seeks permission to demolish an existing two-storey detached dwelling, which is circled in red in the area photo to the left of the slide, and for the erection of an office store and canopy above a parking area. The footprint of the existing dwelling, which is here, and the extent of the private right-of-way from Hackman White Road are shown in the location plan to the right of the slides. The office block, which is this one, would be single storey in height, constructed with block work and powder coated metal sheeting. It will comprise several large openings in the front elevation, allowing vehicles to enter and exit as and when required. A canopy will be erected to the front of the office above an area which would be used for parking. As could be seen in the proposed site plan, the office would be placed in the northern aspect of the site, whereas the canopy and the parking area will be in the middle of the site. The parking area has an indicative capacity of 82 parking spaces. In terms of visual amenity, the proposal could be on balance acceptable from a re for the reasons already set out in the committee report. There is already a wide range of developments on Hammond White Road. The building in this location as could be seen in the photos, are constructed uh, with various materials. The development in question will be close to some terrace houses nearby, but the potential of impact on residential amenity could be mitigated by conditions, again detailed in the committee report. The proposal is considered acceptable from a residential amenity perspective. The site is accessible from Hackman White Road through a private right of way. As you've seen uh, from the photos, the private right of way is relatively narrow and often being used for car parking by the adjacent MOT garage. The visibility from the site access is substandard, partly because of the unauthorized erection of fencing along Hackman White Road, which again is shown in the photos. These are the unauthorized erection of fencing. The the visibility and access alongside a significant intensification of use are considered to have a detrimental impact on highway safety. In addition to highway safety concern, this application, if permitted, would result in the loss of a non designated heritage asset. The appearance of this building uh, are shown in the photos. So that's the re elevation of um, the existing building, and that's the front elevation. That's to decide. Some information has been provided in the heritage statement to justify the development in question. 
However, for the reasons given in the committee report, the total loss of a non-designated heritage asset is not acceptable in terms of the local and national plan policies. The conservation and design team objected to this development as well. Adjacent to the southern boundary is a public footpath, which could be seen in the, uh, in the photos. Although the footpath might be affected by the proposed car parking area, the impact could be satisfactorily mitigated by condition. To conclude, officer considered the proposal does not accord with the local plan policies in relation to highway safety and heritage conservation. The socioeconomic benefits arising from this development do not await the harm to highway safety and historic environments. Officer's recommendation to members is therefore for refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Josh. Right, we've got a few speakers. First speaker is Zahid Hamad. Right, Zayed, you've got three minutes and your three minutes starts now. Oh, good afternoon. Um, I own a 105 X and Y road, uh, which is adjacent to the electrical application site. I also own the access road, uh, Brick, Brick Road. Uh, this is a private one of the road and both can you can you shout up a little bit, Zaid, with members that are having trouble listening to you? Start again. Start again from the beginning, please, a little bit further. Right, okay. So basically, access road, which is not a great road. This is a private road. And both the application side and the MOP have a right of way over the access road. Um, there's a pavement to one side, and they used to be craft village on the other side, which has been tarmacked um, by the MOT station, which now um, is used for parking cars. Um, the point I want to make is that the right of way for the application side. Is on a single lane. Two cars cannot pass side on this access road. Uh, that, can you hear me? Right up. Yeah. This one uh, the right. access to the application site is very restricted and the site is already oversubscribed. Uh, if two cars meet on this road and one has to be able to allow for the car to, to pass. So basically, uh, two cars come on this road, uh, cars that have to reverse into the busy head of white road, and this poses a risk to the road users and pedestrians. Um, there's no parking restrictions on the road outside the site, and quite often the cars that pass on this road, which further reduces visibility when exiting the site. Um, I believe a full application will be detrimental to highway safety. Also, the applicant proposes um, very minimal activity from the site, such as online sales and delivery of vehicles uh, to the customers. Uh, another point I'd like to make is, should this application be approved, then a condition should be attached to the approval to ensure that activity will be kept to a minimum from the site as the application, applicant proposes, uh, there should be no customers visiting the site and sales should be online and they should deliver to customers. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Next speaker is Reyes Chaudhry.
Thank you. For that race, you've got three minutes starting from now. Right, looks like we've got no response from that one, so we'll move on to Antonio Capadelli. I am telling you, you've got three minutes Hi. and it starts from now. Thank you, Chairman, members of the Planning Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of RS Autos, a local business that adjoins this site and shares an access with it. My client agrees with the case officer's professional judgment, which is to recommend this application to be refused. Not only would this development result in the loss of a heritage asset known as Crossfield Farm, but it would also fail to provide adequate access for emergency vehicles and will result in highway chaos. The applicant's desire to make effective use of the land in question is understandable. However, an office and vehicle storage for 82 vehicles is not an appropriate use of the site. Members will be aware that this site is in fact landlocked, surrounded by residential development. A randomly placed office and vehicle storage would appear at odds next to pleasant suburban properties. If the applicant is so keen to secure the future use of the site, he may opt to consider a residential conversion instead, which would be more in keeping with the locality and result with far less vehicles attending the site. The council very recently permitted an additional MLT workshop at the neighbouring RS Auto site. This scheme, however, took several months to prepare and involved expert highway consultants to overcome the council's concerns. The scheme being put, being put forward today, on the other hand, doesn't even have the backing from the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service, who confirmed that the proposed layout would fail to provide suitable access for a fire, fire appliance. If this application is approved and an emergency happens, it may well result in dire consequences. In addition, the scheme includes the capacity to store 82 vehicles as well as an office with very little control over the number of comings and goings to and from the site. No planning conditions can be imposed to control the number of comings and goings, and the very tight access simply cannot take any more development. Moreover, it is not understood how construction vehicles can even enter this site. It is hoped the committee will take on board the case officer's professional judgment, recommend refusal, and recommend <coughs> professional advice of the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Thank you. Thanks, Antonia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, finally, it's Ayers. Ayub. Hey, 
no problem. Thank you. Afternoon, you've got three minutes starting from now. Good afternoon, Chair and Council. Hope you're all well. Afternoon. Uh, I would just like to address the concerns that go through all the relevant points in regards to this planning application. The first point is the public footpath. Uh, in regards to this, I would just like to say that it's not going to get affected in any way or form. Uh, all building work is on the opposite side and the boundary wall with the public footpath is not going to be uh, touched in any way. Point number two is the, the fire engine. <laughs> As for the uh, advice to the planning officer, we did edit the plans and resubmit to leave a six metre gap between each parking row so the fire engine can uh, uh, go around the, all the vehicles access every row and enter the site without doing the U-turn so it could travel freely. Uh, point number three is the uh, highways and safety concerns. As you all may be aware, the highways um, issue was the gates, which are which is a visibility issue. The neighbours have since been granted planning application and they have been advised to either remove the gates or set them back. And uh, the landlord has also instructed solicitors, which are taking the matter to court, for the uh, gate to be removed or set back. Uh, court action has already been taken in regards to this. Also, I see the previous public members have mentioned uh, parking issues. There was uh, vehicles parked by the MOT station uh, left and right on the access road, which was actually uh, uh, not allowed. Uh, Court action has, uh, well, solicitors have since been instructed and the pathway has been cleared. If they obviously continue to block the pathway, it will end up in court with court action. Uh, and the final, the final point is the heritage loss. Uh, the, the site is not a, a residential site any longer. The access is shared with commercial buildings. So as, as you're aware, if, if, if I was living in that property, I would not be wanting to travel through, through uh, commercial buildings and go home. Uh, so the uh, with big commercial gates on the main road. So our only option is to demolish that site and build commercial buildings. And also the building in question is, is, is actually just a shell inside. Uh, there's no electrics, no wiring, no walls. There's no floorboards uh, on the second floor. Um, in some walls are seriously weakened uh, and it, it would require um, ma ma major money pumping into it in order to bring it back to life, which seems to be uh, not an option. It was something that we looked at originally, but it place. was not feasible. That's it, that's three minutes. Okay, okay. thank you very much for your time. No problem, thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, Cathy Scott. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, it's a question to the officers. I actually did the site visit, and I know many of you will. Uh, and uh, it was strange. Obviously, the sight lines, talking about highways again, I was really worried about the sight lines. And I'm sure the officer, as he was speaking, said about enforcement on that fence, if it was set back it, about the access but it's about the width of that access going through as well that I have concerns but can the officer come back to me on that and also it was about fire also said about vehicular access and turning point was that updated because you did say part way through the speech on balance so I'd like that clarifying right got it um Councillor Pina Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Councillor Lawson and I made made a visit here on uh, yesterday, and I, I was really quite impressed with this building. Um, and it does seem a great pity to lose it. Um, it. It looks 19th century from one side, but some parts of the building are considerably older than that. Um, and um, at the very least, there should be a proper survey of it if if anything. Uh, is intended to be done with it. This is quite apart from um, the um, uh, the fact that 
I I think the use proposed on a site surrounded, well, not quite surrounded, but almost surrounded by houses, is, is just not appropriate. Um, and um, I think that it, it would be a nuisance as far as the, the uh, domestic properties are concerned. The other thing I think we need to think about is, is there any possibility of getting access from um, Woodfield, is it Woodfield Terrace? Because that's the address of the house, after all. Um, and um, sorry, Woodland Grove. I do apologise. Um, it does look quite narrow, but but um, if if that's possible, then that that is clearly an alternative to uh, an access straight out on the Heckman Dwight Road, where where yes, I agree with Councillor Scott. The sight lines are dreadful. Um, and um, I, I think we would have another reason for refusing it on the grounds of possible intensification of a substandard access. Um, so, um, uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Turner. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Steve. Um, Andrew's pretty, Andrew and Kathy's pretty much covered what we're going to say. The, the access down there is 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 terrible. Um, it's surrounded by houses. And how many times have we seen developments that's come along and there's been a conflict between what you might term industry and, and, and householders, even when they're being pre-planned. We know that when we built uh, industrial units and houses, there's, there's a conflict. And I think there'd be a conflict and it would be grossly unfair on the, <clears throat> excuse me, the surrounding houses. Um, I think on that, that, from that point of view as well. Um, going back to what Andrew said, this is always a, it's always a bit of a difficult challenge, isn't it? Yes, it's in a historic building, probably, and it probably has some merit. But we 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 sort of want to pass that on to someone else, and it's fine when I'm not putting my hand in my pocket. Um, we always expect someone else to put their hands in the pocket, and I always find this really challenging because yes, it looks a lovely building, I must admit, but you know. We're asking, we may be asking someone to stick his hand in his pocket and spend a lot of money to bring it back into some use. It's always a challenge, is that? Because it's there's never a true being said sentence, and it's always easy to spend somebody else's money. Um, <laughs> so on balance, I think the officers have got it right. The access is terrible. The sight lines are terrible. There's no double yellow lines around there. And I'm looking on, on, on Street View, and getting out of there is bad enough now, let alone with another 80 vehicles potentially going in and out at various points today so i'm totally support of officers recommendations to refuse this thanks graham uh councillor danger mead yeah just basically um to echo what uh, has previously been said um you know it, it's bizarre that this has even come to um planning committee because i think it's one of those situations that's uh very black and white um, it's a beautiful old building um, and it would ma make a great family home maybe with um, some extensions on it, which um, I'm sure the planning would be in favour of something like that or even another residential property on that site because the, um, the boundary looks quite big. So um, possibly another house even. And that would sort of mitigate the cost of renovating the old property, whether or not that would be acceptable, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But um, what was the point I was going to make? Oh, yeah. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of businesses are closing down. Um, and I think going forward, there's going to be a glut of re um, commercial properties available to people. Um, there's going to be a lot of empty properties. And at this point in time, I don't think um, we should be looking at, you know, increasing that. Um, I just don't see the benefit uh, to the community. And I move to accept officer's recommendation for refusal. Thank you, Councillor Lawson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, we went yesterday and we had had a look at the site. Um, it's had all the undergrowth taken off it now and the majority of trees have, been, have gone. Uh, and it kind of exposes the size of the site, but also the limitations. Um, commercial unit seems to be um, probably what's left of what's viable on there. I don't know whether we could get any residential use out of that. Um, it is, uh, a previous speaker said, landlocked almost by residential. 
use and what Councillor Turner was saying about um, having the two uses butting up against each other, commercial and residential, is not ideal. Um, for one, it threatens the future sustainability of the business going forward when they're uh, with noise complaints um, and smell complaints and you know all the rest of it and anything to do with automotive any of the problems that are dealt with with that and you know there's nothing saying that this is not automotive of course however i would agree with uh, what the officers have said uh, in terms of the heritage aspect of that uh, we have seen creative uses of this, but they usually retail, you know, when they incorporate the old building into, into a current use, they usually retail, they usually, uh, well, from what I can remember anyway, a lot of the bars or food or things like that. And this is a terrible site for that, of course, in business terms. So, yeah, um, while I appreciate the, the entrepreneurial uh, joie de vivre, if you like, of the of the application, I I have to go with uh, I have to go with the with the officer's recommendation. So I'll second it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Councillor Patrick. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm afraid I can't see a single reason why I would support it. So uh, um, I'll uh, I'll go with the re the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Councillor Thompson. Uh, yes, I concur. It just seems like one of those uh, cases of half copped and half hearted, and uh, no reason why this really should have come in front of the committee. So I, I wouldn't support it on any level, uh, especially the access. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Scott. I actually did uh, remove uh, the actual request to speak, but I will, because <laughs> I always do. Uh, my question was uh, to you is why hasn't the officer answered my question? Was there enforcement on that fence? Are we enforcing on that fence? And about the fire safety, did they produce anything to you in the report where there was a turning vehicle? I'm not saying I'm supporting the application, but I, there were questions I asked right at the beginning. Josh, are you there? Councillor Hall, it's Jamie again. Jamie, yeah. Yeah, sorry, it's all you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Scott, I was just waiting for, the, for all members to make the comments before addressing you. Uh, yeah. Queries there. There's, an, is, is there an, uh, another application on the, the front of the site. I think one of the speakers was, was from there. At, at present, the visibility is substandard. They've uh, constructed a, a large metal fence. Um, and it's, the visibility isn't the standard that but the application has been approved. That application has the new application has been approved as part of that. They are instructed to set the gates back so the visibility is improved to the standard they expect should be 2.4 meters by 43 uh, meters. In terms of the tracking, um, or oh, sorry, the uh, emergency vehicle access, the layout was altered, amended, but they haven't provided sweat path analysis. They've shown that they've widened the the route round, but they haven't shown that it actually works, and that, that was what we would ask. So, in some in some respects, um, what's been submitted is just not enough for us to give an informed opinion on it, rather than it being wrong. And that's that's one of those examples. Visibility, the visibility isn't because that is is presently substandard, and the display is in third party ownership. Um, they haven't given us anything in the way of um, bin storage or collection pads. Uh, so. There are just bits, bits that, that were missing. And just uh, while I want to address Councillor Pinnock's query about accessing from Woodland Grove, uh, it's difficult on chances because the public right of way that's been mentioned actually would, it'd have, the access would have to cross that public right of way. So we'd have to go back and find uh, something something suitable. It would depend on the the levels of whatever, re residential or business or whatever it may be, the number of vehicles, whether, whether that would be seen acceptable by our prior officers. But, um, and I think that was everything that was, was brought up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Well, it sounds as though it's not got much going for it. So it's been moved and it's been seconded. So we'll go to a vote. Andrea. Thanks, Chair. Um, so voting on the officer's recommendation of refusal. refusal. Council Hall. Four. Councillor Actor. Abstain. Councillor Dad. Abstain. Councillor Granger-Mead. 
Four. Ten. Four. Councillor Lucas. Four. Councillor Patrick. Four. Councillor Pavese. Abstained. Councillor Pennett. Four. Councillor Scott. Four. Councillor Thompson. Four. Councillor Turner. Four. So that's refused. Refused. Right. Page one three. Nine. It's fine, fine one. No, you don't mean that, Steve. Yeah. Final one. The Nelson in at uh, yeah, Thorny. Page, page one, five, three, Steve. Page one, five, three. Can you hear me? Page one, five, Good afternoon, members. Is is the title page come up? Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good afternoon, members. Jenny Booth for development management. The site is the Nelson Inn, which is a public house at Thornhill Lees, and the application is brought to committee given the level of representation received. The application is for a change of use from public house to an education centre and prayer room. The public house is within a local centre as defined in the Kirklees local plan. As noted in the officer report, the proposal will result in the loss of the public house. However, it would be replaced with an alternative community use, which is considered to be appropriate in terms of LP13. There are no external alterations proposed and the change of use would not alter the character of the area, nor would it represent any increase in terms of the impact on the neighbouring properties. The change of use is therefore considered to be acceptable in terms of LP24. Public houses are recognised in the Kirklees local plan as a valuable community facilities and policy LP48 does offer a degree of protection to such uses. To summarise the circumstances of this site, the agent has confirmed that the Nelson Inn has been marketed for three years prior to the first national lockdown with no serious offers to take on the property as a public house. Given the lack of interest over a number of years, it does seem to indicate that the public house is no longer viable. Furthermore, the character of Thornhill Lease has changed over the years, whereby the need for a public house has declined. The new use as an education centre and prayer room is also considered to be a community facility, and as such, the requirements of LP48 are considered to have been met. There is a small car park for six vehicles at the side of the building and the agent has indicated that there would be around 15 students or 10 worshippers on the site at any one time. It has been noted that the site is on a main road through Thornhill Lees and close to junctions with both Ingham Road and Parker Road. That being said, highways officers have provided comments and will support the proposal subject to conditions limiting the numbers of people using the facilities at any one time, as outlined in the agent's supporting statement and the provision of a management plan. If these conditions are included in the decision, the proposal can be considered to be acceptable in terms of highway safety and policies LP21 and 22. There have been 52 representations received with a mix of support and objections. Officers' responses to the objections have been included in the report under points 10.21 to 10.24. To conclude, the application has been considered in terms of the relevant policies and is considered by officers to be acceptable and um, officers recommend delegating it back to, to approve with the suggested conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, right, with one speaker, and it's Hamish Gledhill. Afternoon, Hamish. You've got three minutes starting from now. OK, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name's Hamish Gledhill. I'm the planning consultant speaking on behalf of the application. And this is a relatively straightforward change of use planning application for a building that is now vacant and has been for several years. Changes in leisure patterns and people, people's drinking habits, as well as cultural changes to the population over the last two decades, mean there is no longer a demand for the pub in the area. And the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic have further squashed any demand for a pub on the site. The proposed use will see an efficient use of the building that will not have any impact on the surrounding area and there are no exterior alterations to the building which will change its appearance. 
In planning policy terms, the proposed development accords with the local plan as it sees one community use replaced by another. The change of, the change of use will mean the hours of use of the building will be more socially acceptable and potentially less noise and other disturbance than with a public house. The highways offices are satisfied that the anticipated levels of traffic generated by the proposed development are within acceptable levels. <clears throat> with the cars visiting the premises being able to park within the car park safely and turn around within the site and exit safely. I would hope that members will see the benefits and merits of the proposed development and support this planning, planning application. Thank you. Thanks, Hamish. Cheers, bye. Thank you, bye. Right, um, Councillor Turner. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, I totally support this. It's if you've been trying to sell it for three years uh, prior to COVID and nobody's taking it up, it's never going to. Let's be honest, it's never going to be a pub again, is it? There's so I, I, I totally support this. There's just one question I have. Um, I noticed on site, on or certainly on stream view, there's a bottle bank there. I don't know if that's still there because this is 2019. Uh, but I would like to see uh, the occupants retain that because we don't have enough recycling for glass bottles across Kirkley so that's the only comment I would have. Thanks Graham for that. Uh, Councillor Walker. Thank you Chair, yeah um, recognise the, the principle behind it with the lack of demand for a public house in the area and um, there's just a, a couple of queries on the detail of the plans so the can we bring up the slides again showing the road outside Blackweight Road? While while that's going on, um, I'll just explain a bit about where I'm coming from. So uh, first of all, the car park shows six spaces, which was mentioned in the verbal report you've yeah. given us now. Um, when the written report said seven or eight and the initial letter, covering letter, uh, said seven or eight. And I'm wondering if that could have an impact on the capacity uh, of the building. Also bearing in mind that I believe there's residential quarters on the upper floor that would still be retained. That might impact on the availability of parking for the uh, users of the site. Um, and thanks for bringing that slide up. Um, the other thing was, you can see from the street view, and I saw myself when I went early, I took my own photos, but these are fine as well. And um, the, the access is, it's quite blind, so you can't actually see the car park already. So, it's just, sorry, so if, um, if the car park's already full and someone turns in because they don't have the opportunity to see whether all the spaces are in use, then they can only get out by reversing um, onto that very busy road. Um, the other issue with the car park layout is there's a space. You can see the bottle bank on that photo. Um, I agree, ideally, uh, we should it should be retained. But on the plan shown, there's actually a parking space there right hard up against the boundary. And, and, and looking at the detail of that, I don't see how you can reverse out of that without crossing the, onto the footway. Because obviously when you're reversing and you're turning your wheel left to swing your vehicle round, um, you're going to come out onto the, onto the footway. The other issue is the, the, uh, the tracking analysis done is for medium sized vehicles. And if that's the case, if it can only be used by medium sized vehicles, then I think there needs to be some sort of measuring place to prevent larger vehicles getting onto the site and um, because that would compromise the safety even more um, and this would be I believe this would be in use by children walking and using that footway um, so I do have some safety concerns remaining about that about that car park and the overall capacity of the building so confirmation whether the residential quarters would still be in use that could take up one or two other spaces there might actually only be four spaces available so is it still would it still work for it to be up to 15 students or 10 worshippers on site thank you councillor granger -Mead. um yes i was going to move to uh, approve this application actually but uh, listening to um what uh, councillor lukash has mentioned about parking um I'm just wondering if 
um, officers can work with the applicant. I don't know, looking at the, the building, there is like a conservatory feature on the front, whether or not that can possibly be taken down to increase more parking, I don't know. Um, I would be very uh, reluctant not to um, accept officers' recommendation on this one because, you know, going forward, there's going to be a lot more um, public houses vacant um, after the pandemic, and I wouldn't like to see it go to rack and ruin. Um, I do understand the parking issues, but I'm just wondering if there's any way that, you know, we can somehow work around that. I don't know, different configuration or what have you. I'd just be very reluctant to not accept officer's recommendation at this stage. So I don't know. Right. Um, Jamie, can you come in, please? Uh, yeah, does Councillor Lucas you want to come back in first, though? No. Oh. Yeah. Yes, please. There's one thing. Sorry, there's one thing I forgot to mention. So that disabled parking space, um, currently in that area, there's a smoking shelter and there's bollards. Um, the, the application says there's to be no exterior alterations to the building. So there might be a bit of a contradiction in there as well. Don't know if it's been confirmed whether there are actually, whether that is actually going to be taken out to enable room for that parking space. And I will grab myself a drink in a minute, minute sorry. Jamie was going to come in. Just it's, all right. it's okay, I'll wait. It's all right. Is it all right to come in? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah. come in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, um, all, yeah. All, all I'd say really uh, is that uh, Councillor Lucas makes some valid points. And I think if it was a brand new build, we might say you know, you, those, those movements. Can we can we do something more? Can something can the can the size of the the, the building be made less than to increase the, the parking? But it's got a, an existing use as a public house. No, yes, it's been up for sale for three years, but it, it, its current use is is a public house, and we have to take that into account when we, when we're assessing the the parking. Somebody could somebody could reopen it tomorrow as a as a pub again if they wanted, and think that 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 would be. I don't think this application would intensify the use of the of the site in terms of vehicle movements and so that's that's why we've in part made the judgment and certainly why we've asked for a condition to limit numbers to 10 worshippers or 15 pupils um they have demonstrated the threat pass that they can get in and out um don't know the answer about the bottle bank because it does look like it's disappeared um i don't know if they could retain that by just moving it elsewhere on the site where it's not within the uh, Sweat bath of the, of the vehicles that they've, that they've shown there, um, but that's really really answer to why sort of uh, quite quite the opposite of all the other applications I've had today, where parking and the, the ability to the visibility and stuff's almost been paramount. Of course, safety is still paramount, but we've got to consider the existing use and whether this intensifies it. We don't feel that it does, so that that's why the judgment was made on in, in that manner in this instance. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, most. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jamie, to uh, for clarifying all that. Um, I want to move it on to uh, Office's uh, recommendation of an approval. So, you, Graham, did you move it? I'll think. I'll second it then. Right, right. Um, Councillor Scott. Yeah, I think a lot's already been said. I, I, the point I was going to make, what you've got in before you, it's already uh, as a public house. It was used as a public house. It managed well with traffic. Uh, they've actually put in the report the numbers of people. So I'm happy to support this uh, recommendation. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, Councillor Lawson. Thank you, Chair. I was just about to delete my speak button, but I'll just say... Uh, I, it's a solid piece of work by officers. It's a good report, marks it out well. Um, no problem accepting the, uh, the recommendation. Councillor Thompson. Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just wondered that less than three years ago, um, there was a, a mosque built just over the road and um, whether there wasn't room for expansion there or the community hub that's only 400 yards away 
it, instead of going into what won't be an ideal building, an ideal location. So that that's, was my only um, question and conundrum was why we're not using existing rather than the new and not purpose built. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Councillor Lokic. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks for the comments, uh, Jamie. Um, I'm still concerned that particular car park layout, as, as I see it, isn't, um, can't be implemented without exterior alterations to the building. Um, it's, it's just, it physically overlaps exterior features of the building. Um, so on that basis, I'd like to move a deferral just to make sure we have complete accuracy over what changes are required to the building to implement this scheme. Thank you. Anybody else wanting to speak? No. Right, it's been moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Pervez for accepting officer's recommendation. I'll go to Andrea. Thank you. Members, um, Councillor Hall? For. Councillor Actor? For. Councillor Dad? For. Councillor Granger Mead? For. Councillor Lawson? Councillor Lawson for. Councillor Lukic against. Councillor Patrick for. Councillor Bays for. Councillor Pinnock for. Councillor Scott for. Councillor Thompson. Councillor Thompson. Councillor Turner uh, for. So that's a delegate approval, Carrie, thank you. That, uh, colleagues, is it for today? Thank goodness. See you all next time. Yeah. Thank you, bye. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Th